Welcome back. Today I sit down with my good friend and exercise physiologist, Drew Harrisburg. We talk about a bunch of new studies, including a meta-analysis looking at how plant-based diets affect aerobic performance, strength, and power. And I think people have the assumption that it's a trade-off. It's like, I'm gonna trade off my strength and power for my endurance. Not necessarily true. You can really just honestly look around and see how many thousands of people are eating a plant-based diet and they're doing just fine. Like you don't waste away and you're not all of a sudden weak. But if you don't do it properly, you probably will have a little bit of a, a decrease initially. A new study from previous guest Andrea Glenn on the portfolio diet and risk of cardiovascular disease. This is probably one of the number one resources that I send to people. If someone hits me up on an email or an inbox and says, hey, I've gone to my doctor, had my, la my labs done, I have a family history of cardiovascular disease, I have high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol. My doctor's told me to make some lifestyle changes you know, with a focus on nutrition. Like, what do I do? Read these two pages yeah. <laughs> as a starting point. And a new study from Walter Willett and colleagues at Harvard on red meat consumption and risk of type 2 diabetes. Total red meat, processed red meat, and unprocessed red meat were all strongly associated with type 2 diabetes risk, and it was a linear relationship, dose dependent. Right. So the more of each of those, the higher the risk of type 2 diabetes. In this exchange, you will learn about ways to optimize a plant-based diet for performance, the dietary guidelines that I think are best, what the portfolio diet is, and who should think about following it, what causes type 2 diabetes, and much more. Enjoy. What am I drinking here, mate? <laughs> smart energy. Is this a smart thing to be doing at 2.44 p.m.? Yeah, I was just about to say. <laughs> yeah, I usually stop drinking coffee at 2 p.m. is my cutoff. And even that's pushing it. I feel like I need it to get through the next two or three hours. Of journal club? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's I have go. a pile of studies on, here. How many milligrams are we drinking here? It's only 100 milligrams of caffeine. But yeah, but what about the other compounds that give you energy? Like L-theanine. There's yeah, Siberian ginseng. No, we're good. 100 milligrams of caffeine. That's So in six hours time, half of that half will of that still will be in be. our blood. And what would that be? 8.45 9 p.m. PM that's, yeah. that's close to my bedtime. That's man. past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Grandpa here. I've got a lot of studies today. Oh, <laughs> I feel so underprepared. You've got like a journal club sitting on the desk there. I've got one study. Yeah. Which I read well, I've been preparing for a bunch of podcasts yeah. coming up. So I've, I've had to deep dive a number of different I'm studies. Excited. I don't even want to look over that side of the table. Surprise me. Mm. Just throw them at me. Well, the one that I think you'll perhaps be most interested in, you'll be interested in all of these, but perhaps given your interest in exercise, is a study that came out, I think it was three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. You might have seen this. Mm -hmm. Looking at weekend warrior exercise. Have we spoken about this? I don't think we spoke about this. Okay. So the purpose of the study was to see whether doing all of your aerobic cardiovascular exercise, which they, they described as moderate to vigorous. Mm -hmm. If you were doing sort of most of that on the weekend, like a weekend warrior, okay. versus evenly spreading it out across the week. Right. And this was using the UK Biobank cohort. So I think it was like nearly 90,000 people that were included. Yeah, 89,573 subjects. And they were followed for a long time i think it was a decade or more mm. and these particular subjects wore an accelerometer for one week mm -hmm. to look at the exercise that they were doing and how it was distributed over a week and then they were able to group people so those that were doing 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise which is the recommendations per week mm -hmm. Those that were doing 150 minutes evenly spread across the week, those that were doing most of that 150 minutes on the weekend, and then compared to people that were not doing 150 minutes. Cool. And the idea was to see, is there a difference in the cardiovascular disease benefits based on how you distribute that exercise? Mm -hmm. What do you think they found? <laughs> I knew that was going to be the next question. <laughs> we love to put each other on the spot. Okay. 
my gut tells me that even distribution would be more optimal than just jamming it all in on one or two days for a few reasons. It's very clear that the acute benefits of exercise, like you have these immediate benefits, right, in the moment. So my gut tells me that if you can get the acute benefits spread evenly across the week, every single day or even more than once a day, that you will do better than somebody who just gets that huge volume in one or two days because then on the other five days of the week, you're missing out on the acute benefits of exercise, right? And then, of course, extrapolate that over years. I think you'll get better benefits if you have that even distribution. That would be my... I'm I'm wrong. Okay. (laughs) So either way, whether you did that 150 minutes spread throughout the week or most of it on the weekend... Better than nothing massive risk reductions in cardiovascular sure. disease. So they looked at atrial fibrillation, heart attacks, heart failure, and stroke. They were the the four outcomes of interest. Mm-hmm. And you know, across the board, no matter how you distributed that exercise, compared to the sedentary person, right. there was about a 20% reduction in risk of atrial fibrillation, yeah. uh, around 25 to 30% risk reduction for a heart attack almost 40% risk reduction for heart failure mm-hmm. and almost 20% risk reduction for stroke. Okay. There was no significant difference between the two groups. Interesting. Now, there is, I think, a little bit of a limitation with this in the way that they decided who was a weekend warrior and who was not. Mm-hmm. It was, you, you essentially, you were a weekend warrior if you did more than 50% of your 150-minute activity on the weekend yeah and the others were less than 50 percent right but it might have been that there's just not a whole lot of difference right. between the two groups mm-hmm. right because you might do 60 percent of your activity on the weekend and 40 percent through the week yep. compared to the opposite 40 percent kind of midweek and 60 percent sorry 60 yeah. percent midweek and 40 percent on the weekend sure and you don't classify as a weekend warrior and you right. don't classify as a weekend warrior yeah. so you wouldn't really expect yep. a big difference yep. so it might have been that there's just not enough contrast right like i'd be interested if they looked more at 80, 20 or people that did 80 yeah. percent of their exercise on the weekends same yeah i mean i would also be interested in seeing other outcomes measured though because those outcomes are obviously very important but what about like metabolic outcomes that relate to glycemic control that that's where i would say hold on a second if you had to choose between spreading it evenly over seven days or jamming it into two and you care about diabetes or glycemic control, for sure you're going to get better management with daily. Because the time and range is going to be affected. Every meal is affected. Like walking after meals for 20 minutes, we know can do amazing things to blood glucose control. And then that might even become more important based on your metabolic health. Yeah. So who are the subjects that you're looking at? Exactly. Because if you have pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, then there might be an even stronger case for daily exercise yes. versus being the weekend warrior. Right. But then, as you say, compared to somebody who's sedentary, just do something. Try hit the hit the dose. Yeah. So the good news is if you're someone who Monday to Friday is just strapped for time yep. and the only time that you can fit your cardiovascular exercise in is on the weekend, you can still get huge reductions in in risk for these cardiovascular events yes but then if we talk about somebody let's say who has different goals right non-cardiovascular goals different this is completely different conversation right if you have strength goals or bone density goals i don't think it's going to cut it doing your all your exercise on one day unfortunately which is why and it gets tough in in the just the one weekend to cover your moderate intensity cardiovascular, high intensity cardiovascular, and strength training. Yes, all in two days. Yeah. So, th- so one of the takeaways is, don't worry. It's better than nothing. If you only have one or two days, great. Get it in. Find a way to get it in. Um, but if you can spread it out across a week and use different modalities, you'll probably right. get better results. But if you only had one or two days, this mm-hmm. is something we've spoken about before. Then, would you be doing 150 plus minutes of moderate? cardiovascular Mm. exercise Mm. or would you be having a bias to strength training and high intensity yeah yeah i would think that personally i would put more into the high intensity stuff if i only had two days and i mean also like i'm assuming they only have like an hour or so per workout so like two hours over a weekend to work out i'm not trying to do two you know two to three hours of just moderate cardio i would be 
trying to get a bit of everything. And we know that the, that moderate intensity cardio is not the only way to improve cardiovascular health and fitness, right? Even resistance training improves risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So does high intensity, even sprint training, which is very, very low duration. But again, this just think about how many tools we have, which is what I love about this kind of stuff. The, the exercise toolkit is quite large and most people will have a preference to one thing or another, but just know that there are so many options. There's so many different ways you can do it. And we spoke about this in Bali, like over and over in every workshop, like what are your goals? What are your preferences? You know, we're going to be creating essentially these movement plans for everybody and everyone has different preferences. Not, they don't and not the just preferences, but different starting points. Right. So exactly. when you actually, you measure your current health status, be it through functional tests like we did, plus blood biomarkers, where where are your strong points and where are your weak points? Yeah. And therefore, where should you be focusing? Yeah, 100%. And how do we test them and how do you retest them? All of that stuff. I mean, that was, I, I know we're probably going to talk about Bali later, but now that we're on the topic, like for me, that was- Let's hit it right now. Yeah, just get it. It's just a, a, a Bali recap. <laughs> There's no rules on this show. I love it. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I was going to say to you, what is your sort of biggest takeaway from the, the retreats we, we held? Like what, how do you feel about them and what was the- the most impactful or personally impactful part of it for you? The most impactful part for me was seeing the transformations. I know. And, and from, on an individual level so and a group level. Wild. Uh, in seven days. Wild. And, and then in terms of the program and the work that we'd done, uh, kind of taking that out and putting it through a bit of a test yeah. and seeing uh, how empowering it can be to teach people about what matters with regards to um, predictors of longevity, mm. teaching people how you can measure those things so you can get a window into your current health and your risk of chronic disease, and then teaching how do you science-based interventions yeah. to improve that on an individual level based, again, on what are your strong points, what are your weak points. I was amazed by how thirsty people were for information. Yeah. And I think beforehand I said to you, I'm like, have we, are we, <laughs> are we sharing too much here? Yeah. Are we going to lose people? Yeah, yeah. It was the opposite. It was the total opposite. Yeah. I feel like we underestimated the, like you say, the thirst, the hunger for knowledge from the group. It was crazy. How I, th I think in the second week I spoke for four hours. <laughs> and I just stood, stood next to you. No, and, and they just wanted more. <laughs> I was amazed. I know. It was incredible. What a group. But again, it's, it's just a reflection of your audience. Like very, very health conscious, you know, evidence-based people who just want to learn to improve their lives. And seriously, as you say, the transformations in one week, I could not believe how rapid they were. Like that's why when you see someone, you know, their first time getting into an ice bath and then on day seven, totally different human being. You cannot even compare the two. Yeah. Vincent and Josh. and wow. uh, They won't mind us saying their names no. i'm sure uh their transformation that <laughs> that first 10 seconds of vincent in an ice bath i'll never forget uh, i'll never forget maybe we'll overlay a little clip somewhere in this or somewhere on, on instagram at some point but my god that was something else he went from completely out of control panic attack cold response to day six the ice man like the whim of and then he got out and he was like staring at the gods. Like it was just incredible, that transformation. And then- And his wife, we saw them uh, maybe two days or the day after the retreat had ended. Yeah. Randomly we bumped into them in a, re a restaurant in Ubud. Yeah. Zest actually. Yeah. Good good spot to check out if you're, if you're uh, in Ubud. And she, she looked at me <laughs> and said, you and, you and Drew have- <laughs> Changed my husband. What have you done to he's my a, husband? He's a changed man. She goes, what have you done to my husband? Uh, in the best way possible. Like, he, yeah. he was just a different person. Um, great then, guy. Yeah, what a legend. But everyone, everyone, such a great group of people. Everyone got along so well. Everyone grew together. Um, and then for me, one of the biggest sort of most impactful moments was watching people do the group challenge that was set up and it was intentionally extremely difficult. Before the challenge, everybody thinking, there's no way I can do this. I know I can't do it. Impossible to everyone finished it. 
Mm. Nobody quit. Getting then, around each other. Yeah. And then the feeling after, like the high, the endorphin overdose was just incredible. And then, yeah, like Ruth, for example, came up to me and said, I didn't know I could do any of that. I wanted to quit every two minutes and she finished the whole workout, you know. Dorothy, she finished the whole workout, you know. Like it's just <laughs> unbelievable. I was so, so happy to see people sort of pushing themselves and embracing the discomfort of the week. The other thing that really surprised me, well, kind of doesn't surprise me um, given the state of healthcare, but I, I would like to think in, in developed countries like Australia and the US were pretty good at screening people was the number of people that came to the retreat. And so part of coming to the retreat was we sent a list through of recommended tests to do. Mm. And we would only recommend tests that are have been validated in terms of you know providing useful information that you can then act on um you know we weren't asking people just to do a create a, a plethora of kind of crazy expensive tests that aren't that meaningful and one of the tests that we encourage people to do is a dexa scan yeah and was it three maybe three four people, people had undiagnosed who bone density. based on that dexa scan realized that they were either osteopenic or had full-blown osteoporosis yeah. crazy crazy and i mean to show up on the retreat and sort of i think some of them only got the results literally days before um but to still show up and be like you know what i'm going to just dive into this thing take the guidance of, of simon and drew and you know we're going to do and we you know we had to change a couple things to make it safe but yeah. it also shows you if you don't screen your group and you don't really know the health of the people in Which there. Which is basically every retreat around right. the world. Right. I mean, there is obviously a degree of screening, but there's usually it's sign of liability <laughs> waiver. Sure. Right. If you don't know, that, like, especially knowing the bone health of people who are maybe a little bit older and have a risk of falling, and then you're going and doing these group workouts, which is sometimes hard to scale in real time because you've got young, very fit people, and then you've got maybe some older, completely inexperienced people. To, to figure out a way to get the whole group to safely train together was, was yeah. part of the challenge. And I mean, we, we obviously did it, and obviously no one got hurt. But yeah, like you say, just getting that DEXA showed you know osteoporosis in some And people. also helpful Incredible. to have the, the labs done that give an insight into metabolic health yeah. and you know, screening to see if anyone has undiagnosed type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that was one of the strengths of our program was having all of that testing done and then having a physician review mm. everything yeah. prior to the retreat. And then some of the fitness tests that we did <clears throat> while we were there um, on ground, I mean, people were just so up for it. Like I thought a beep test would not be something that people would be like, yeah, let's go. But pretty much everyone was excited to give it a crack. You know? Yeah, I think what hooked people was understanding that the beep test correlates really strongly with your VO2 max and spending time to explain to people why VO2 max is important. Why, why is this yeah. something we care about? How does it predict your risk of premature death? Then that gave more meaning yeah. to the beep test. Yeah. And that was the theme of the week, which was understand the why behind these markers. Why are we measuring them? Why do they matter? What can we do about them? And without that why component, I just feel like you're just telling people to do things that they don't really know. If you don't know why, it's so much harder to adhere to it. It's like everyone knows, you know, don't smoke, don't do this, don't do that. But when you really go a little bit deeper, just one little layer deeper but below the surface, that might be the thing that helps it stick for somebody long term, you know. Speaking of bone health as well, tomorrow I have a podcast with Darren Kandow. Yeah. Who's he's he's a, a researcher that is pretty much focused on creatine. Right. I had Eric Rawson on a while back. Yeah. And Darren Darren um, is involved in similar research. Right. But he published a paper in 2015, which was a pilot study looking at creatine oh, supple okay. supplementation it's in postmenopausal women. Because you, you flashed a slide on screen at the yeah, workshops. Yeah, it's interesting. So they were, the initial study he ran, the pilot study a few years back, showed that postmenopausal women, and remember, I think it's the average age of menopause is 51. Mm -hmm. It can occur any time between 47 and 51 usually. Right. But in that first like five years, yeah. there's five to seven and a half percent of bone loss. Right. It's very rapid in the first five years. Yeah. And then it kind of slows down a bit, but it does continue. 
And of course, there's things you can do, many of which you spoke about at the retreat. Mm -hmm. But this area of research looking at creatine and um, bone mineral density has been really, really interesting. And there's some sort of preliminary research that suggests that creatine might help stimulate osteoblasts, mm. the cells in bone that produce more bone tissue. Yeah. And so that initial pilot study in 2015 suggested in postmenopausal women that were supplementing, it was about, I think it was 0.1 grams of creatine per kilogram per day. Okay. So 70 kilogram woman, that's seven grams. Right. 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 And it's in quite that a large dose, actually. Yeah, yeah. In that study, there was a significant increase in bone mineral density. Right. He followed that up with a much more robust, bigger study that was published last year or earlier this year, a two year randomized controlled trial. And mm. that's the one that I spoke about at the retreat. Okay. Slightly higher dose, it was 0.13 grams per kilogram. Yeah. No differences in bone mineral density, but there was differences in bone geometry. Right. That's what I was that's the slide I was thinking of. And, and their conclusion is that those differences, they could be clinically relevant right. in terms of, because it's not just density that determines no. the strength of a bone, but also like architecture, Yes, the way that the bone is structured. And so it might be that creatine is not necessarily affecting the density, but is affecting more of the architecture mm -hmm. and in a way that could help it withstand more force. Right. And really that's... The main thing you're worried about is breaking a bone from a fall yeah. or an injury. So if that helps and your bone density doesn't change, then that's a net win. In my yeah. Books. And so they're, I, I think they're going to carry that study out longer so that you can actually track harder outcomes like mm. fractures Yeah. In, in a group of women that continue to supplement mm. um, creatine. But I think it would be sensible to supplement creatine anyway for right. women that are postmenopausal. If you're trying to like reduce the risk of fractures... Mm. Really, you have to do you know, two main things. One, try and reduce your risk of having a fall mm -hmm. in the first place, which is going to come down to like muscle strength, right. coordination, yep. stability, balance. And then secondly, you want, you want to increase the strength of your bones. Right. Like they're the two things that you want to focus on, right? Mm -hmm. And creatine, let's say that it's still preliminary as to how it affects bone. Mm -hmm. We know for sure it improves muscle strength. Sure. Right, and I think I've I've read a few studies that suggest that creatine can improve like sit to stand test time, right? Things like that, right? Yeah, your non conventional like you're not doing like strength testing in the gym. It's 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 become this like bro nutrient where like the bodybuilding community and rightfully so, it's a it's a really ergogenic supplement. But I think that the clinical applications are being missed because it's so popular in the bodybuilding supplement world. You know, and we spoke about a little bit in Bali as well about like the effect on cognition and then we've got the bone architecture component. Then you've got other clinical populations who may benefit like in, in a sit to stand test. You wouldn't think that would make a big difference, right? Mm. But the mechanism is strong. And I wonder as well, if you can improve muscle mass and strength mm -hmm. with creatine supplementation plus resistance training, because all these studies that sure. look at creatine are with resistance training. I was going to ask you, have you ever seen a study that looks at the intervention of, cre of creatine without I think there's a few, and I, I think it still has some Something, benefit, yeah, but it's it very small. small. Yeah. You need you need the, the sort of anabolic signal there. Sure. And part of the, the, the beauty of creatine is that it allows you yeah. to produce more volume for a given load. Actually, right? and this was another interesting thing that I want to speak to Darren about, is in, in the postmenopausal um, study that he did with women supplementing creatine, a lot of these studies do resistance training. Mm-hmm. But correct me if I'm wrong, like if we're thinking about in improving bone strength, resistance training is important. Yep. You get the pull, the muscle pull, like force going from the muscle to the tendon, pulling on the bone. But then you also spoke about ground reaction forces yeah. and doing ex like weight bearing exercise that subjects you to a higher ground reaction force right. than everyday life. Yep. And a lot of these studies, I don't believe have used that in the intervention. Yeah. Yeah, the multimodal sort of program for osteoporosis is where the gold is. So high impact weight bearing, jolting the skeleton on hard surfaces, doing more stuff barefoot, not always wearing like cushioned shoes, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, so you're saying if you did that same creatine with a better program that includes the multimodal style of training, whether you'd get even better results. Yeah, it does the type of exercise that it's coupled with right. affect whether the creatine is effective or not. Right, interesting.
I would think it would, but yeah, I mean, independent of creatine use, those interventions work really mm-hmm. well. So I imagine if creatine can help you get more reps or reduce that, you know, time to fatigue, so to speak, per set, then yeah, mm-hmm. you'd think it would. But as you say, for me, it's a do no harm approach. If you, if we know that creatine improves for sure muscle like metabolism, maybe pretty good for bone as well, and we know it's probably do no harm. Why aren't we all taking it? Yeah. And, and if you're cheap. improving your strength and your muscle mass, I think I started this train of thought earlier and I, I left it, but yeah. then wouldn't that be increasing the kind of force that you're subjecting the skeleton just, to? Yeah, just your daily um, activities would be under more more load. It's right. like wearing a weight vest. Yeah. You can add three kilos of muscle. It's probably not enough, to be honest, because I remember like reading into the weight vest studies and the vest was a, a very large percentage of their body weight. But what if you can lift more weight then because yeah. you've got stronger? Yeah, for sure. So you're saying like just the just by having stronger muscles, so you take creatine, your muscles are a little bit stronger, you can train harder in the gym, you'll get a, a quicker adaptation because you can load more. That's a hypothesis. A hypothesis. Now, someone might push back and say, well, they did that study and <laughs> they didn't see right. an increase in bone mineral density. But again, it might it might be that the bone is stronger despite not having an increase in bone mineral density. Okay, yes. Yeah, because of changes to bone architecture. Right. Something I want to speak to hit to yeah. Darren about is the architecture thing is if we're measuring bone strength, currently people go you you you'll go and do a DEXA scan. Right. But is there other types of imaging or scans that mm. can be helpful for understanding you know, how likely you are to have a fracture? Right. Like you could look at two apartment blocks that look identical on the outside, but one of them has a strong foundation. Mm. And the other one is like rotting inside. And from the outside, they look the same. That's what kind of a DEXA scan in a way is doing, right? You're getting this bone density. You don't know about the architecture. There was an image you flashed on screen of like the porous bones within yeah. like a hip. It was like a cross-sectional image. Was I don't know what they used for that. Was it MRI or something? I think it was MRI. MRI. That, I mean, that shows you really what the architecture of the bone is. But how? how imagine trying to do that for the population. Getting everyone doing an MRI of their hips if they're at risk. I don't know. Is it affordable? Is it easy to do? Is it necessary? I don't know. These are questions that Ask the, yeah. we will explore. Yeah, exactly. Save them for, the, for Daz. Uh, also related to exercise, I have another study here, particularly um, relevant, I guess, to the way that you and I eat and many of the listeners. So this came out... Um, probably only a couple of weeks ago. And it was a study from Coimbra et al. Plant-based diets benefit aerobic performance and do not compromise strength, power, performance, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Really interesting. They, you know, meta-analysis, um, so it, they, they were reviewing the body of, of literature that already exists, so studies that have looked at how... Do, does shifting to a plant-based dietary pattern affect physical performance? Mm-hmm. And they were looking at different aspects of physical performance. So aerobic performance, strength, and power. And they had four studies included in this that were looking at aerobic performance, and then six studies that were looking at strength and power. They found that the plant-based diets actually had a moderate but positive effect on aerobic performance. Mm-hmm. And there are some mechanisms that might explain that, that we can... Uh, discuss yeah and then there was no significant difference between the plant-based diets and control diets omnivorous diets for strength and power performance right um given the same stimulus assuming which i think is a positive because a number of people would think that adopting a plant-based diet you might one of the downsides might be that you're you know, giving up some of your strength right. or power performance or that you'll see a decline. Right. So the fact that there was no significant difference, I actually think that's that's a win for, sure. for plant-based And diets. I think people have the assumption that it's a trade-off. It's like, I'm going to trade off my strength and power for my endurance. Mm. Not necessarily true. Right. And and I think that by now, I mean, I know this is a pretty weak anecdote, but you can, look, you can really just honestly look around and see how many thousands of people are eating a plant-based diet. 
and they're doing just fine. Like you don't waste away and you're not all of a sudden weak. And But if you don't do it properly, you probably will have a little bit of a yeah. decrease initially. I wanted I to chat that. about that because I think there are some areas that you need to focus on. Yes, um, I think so too. But just before that, the increase in aerobic performance. Yeah. I, again, I think I think anecdotally... There's enough success stories out there to know that something's going on. You see athletes towards the end of their career yeah. start migrating to plant-based diets. You see a lot of endurance athletes yep. talking about how how much better they're recovering, for example. Some of the best ultra-endurance athletes of all time were fully vegan. Yeah, And it's not fully understood, but there are some mechanisms that might explain that. And, and some of them are, are quite obvious. So increased consumption of antioxidants mm-hmm. and anti-inflammatory compounds that could assist with recovery sure uh increased consumption of polyphenols and nitrates which could help increase or improve blood flow and the delivery of oxygen to muscles and also the clearance of metabolic byproducts that accumulate during exercise and then a really obvious one is higher glycogen i was going to say storage a higher carbohydrate intake yeah yeah that that to me is probably the most obvious because I've, I've heard, again, this is anecdotal, lots of MMA fighters who and CrossFit athletes, when the, do you remember like years ago, the craze was the zone diet and it was a very low carb diet for these CrossFit yeah. athletes and it was super popular. Everyone was on a pretty much- It was like an Atkins style yes, diet. I think they were eating up to 150 grams of carbs a day. And we're talking about athletes who are performing monster volumes over the week and huge workouts. And the popularity of that low carb diet within that community- took a bit of a knock because people weren't performing as well as they, they were before. And then all of these great athletes would come out and say, I upped my carbs from 150 to 650 and my performance is through the mm. roof. Now, is it the plants? Is it the polyphenols? Or is it just literally having more glycogen, replenishing your stores, better energy availability? I would say it's probably a lot of it is the carbohydrate intake. You know, these, these CrossFit athletes are a good window into elite physiology. And if they're only eating 150 grams of carbs a day, that's that's pretty low for that kind of volume. So upping your carbs is a no-brainer. Um, but then you also hear, just to, to play devil's advocate, you hear the flip side of the coin, which is low-carb endurance athletes who reckon their performance has never been better on a ketogenic-style diet, right? So you, you're going to find cases where both can work for sure. Like they're, Are they, they're training low, but then they race high? I don't know. I, I can't see how racing with depleted glycogen could be beneficial. They don't actually say that it's de- that they're depleted in glycogen when they're racing, though. And but they- I think if you're not if you're not con- if you're consuming a very low carbohydrate diet, mm. you're you're not going to have full glycogen stores. I thought that too. <laughs> I thought that too. <laughs> and th- there was a study. Oh, I wish I had it with me. I, I did not plan on talking about this, so I don't have the the reference. But I can. I'll dig it we up. We can after. come back to it. Okay, we'll come back to it. There was a study by a very popular low carb advocate, a Volek. scientist. Yeah, it was Volek. I'm pretty Jeff sure. Volek. Jeff, Jeff Volek. Yeah. He presented a study. I don't know if it was his study or one that he leans on heavily, but it was essentially answering that question. Are people who are low carb glycogen depleted when they perform and go into race day? And what he was showing was that when you look at the muscles of these people who are on a very low carb, often ketogenic diet, their, their glycogen replenishment is actually pretty good. Yeah, I thought... This Brack. is bringing back some some memories. I think yeah. have we, we might have this? spoken about this off Years air because I thought is it Sarah is it Sarah Burke? You're right. I thought she did a review on this. Um, we, we definitely need to come back to this yeah. in another episode. But I thought she did a review that was suggesting that that was an outlier. That study of Jeff Foley. Pr- probably right. Um, no, we did speak about this. Did we speak about with Rooney? It might have been with Rooney. Yeah. Yes. No. I, but it, was, it could have been off air. I think it might have been off air. But anyway, this is something I find it interesting. So there are people who will say that even if you're low carb, you can still replenish your glycogen. It's just the body does it in a different way. And I pro- went to a, a conference and he was talking and I, sa- I took the mic and asked a question at the end. And I said, is it that the liver through gluconeogenesis is providing glucose systemically and the muscles are taking it up and replenishing glycogen, right? So they're not eating carbs, but somehow after this long endurance event, they're you know, the next day, 24, 48 hours later, even on a low carb diet, they seem to have pretty much fully replenished glycogen stores. And so my obviously pr- surface level understanding was that, well, they're getting, they're coming from somewhere. Has to come from somewhere. Come from somewhere. It must be the Not liver. eating it. Yeah. So I thought the liver would, but then my, what I thought was, again, don't know, I'm not a professor. 
Is it that the liver is converting other nutrients into glucose? Could be amino acids or muscle tissue, could be fat. Turning it into glucose, goes into the system, muscles soak it up, store it as glycogen. He said no. He said that, that doesn't So count. where does he think it's coming from? He didn't, uh, didn't get an answer. Okay. So this is our continued. Homework. Yeah, let's look into this. My hypothesis would be that, yes, they would have some glycogen in muscle tissue, but I don't think it would be completely full. No, I, I agree. I think it's below their capacity. And there's some pretty good sports science showing that you get super compensation of your glycogen stores if you consume your carbohydrates immediately after, hmm. right? So you can fit more in quicker if you if you go so straight muscle's up. like a sponge. It's a sponge. It's ready. If you don't do it like that way, then you're, you've got an insulin-sensitive muscle for hours and hours after, 16 to 48 hours later. So it doesn't, as long as you're not trying to perform again on the same day, it actually doesn't matter how quickly you replenish your glycogen stores. You just got to have them replenished by the next workout. That's the main thing. Slight tangent. Yeah. I had Roy Taylor on the show finally. Finally. <laughs> how was it? And it, it, it came up, we were discussing the twin cycle hypothesis, which is his hypothesis that he had, I think back in 2008 to explain type 2 diabetes. And which he would now say, or does now say, it's a model, like he's proven that hypothesis. But that sort of, um, there's a bit of overlap here with glycogen and what we're talking about here. So in this state of, um, of type 2 diabetes, he, he explains the twin cycle hypothesis like this. So you have this positive energy balance, mm -hmm. so a small calorie surplus over a sustained period of time. In the context of someone who has muscle insulin resistance, right? Okay, this is these are the the two primary things that kind of kick off these twin cycles, <clears throat> and because the body ha has difficulty in that state getting glucose into muscle tissue, it has to do something with that glucose, yep. and it goes to the liver, and the liver converts that glucose into fat, mm -hmm. de novo lipogenesis, and that's what then starts to ramp up liver fat, right? which as we spoke about at the retreat, then starts to create insulin resistance in the liver. right? And so the net effect of that is blood glucose actually starts to, to go up yeah. and the pancreas responds initially by pumping out more insulin. Now, this is like a positive feedback loop because yep. insulin tells the liver to actually produce more fat. So de, no de novo lipogenesis right. goes up yeah, exactly. again and then you have increasing amounts of fat in the liver, yep. that insulin resistance in the liver is getting worse. So it, basically insulin is not working as well to turn off glucose production from the liver. Yep. And eventually, and this is the missing piece, and I want to get your, your view on this. Mm. I think it's fascinating. Everyone sees type 2 diabetes as a, a glucose problem, right? And it's because there's continuous glucose um, monitors yep. and, you know, it's kind of... Type 2 diabetes has kind of become synonymous with blood glucose dysregulation. Yeah. But at the same time as there is this blood glucose dysregulation, there is dysregulation to blood lipids. Yeah, which isn't spoken about. Right. So you have all this fat building up in the liver. Right. So it gets to a point where it spills over. Yeah. And again, connecting some dots with Thomas Dayspring's episodes, fat can't just freely flow. Mm-hmm in the blood like glucose can it has to be carried it's not water soluble so it goes on to the lipoprotein so the liver has this excess triglyceride fat mm. it says well we've got to get rid of it so it puts it on to proteins apob containing lipoproteins and yeah. pumps it out as these vldl molecules yeah. that go into circulation now that we know that they're highly atherogenic so that's one of the reasons why people with type 2 diabetes have a high risk of cardiovascular disease mm because they have increased levels of these ApoB-containing lipoproteins floating around. Mm. Now, the, the high blood sugar also damages the blood vessels, but um, you have that excess triglyceride getting pushed into circulation, and then if that person, if, if that fat can't be stored subcutaneously because they've kind of exceeded that capacity, mm -hmm. then it starts going into organs, specifically the pancreas. Right. And he clarified for me that when you have increasing amounts of this fat that going inside the pancreas, it doesn't cause the beta cells to, to you don't get apoptosis. It's not like cell death, no. but it causes them 
it impairs their ability to secrete insulin. Right. And over a long time, it ca- can actually cause irreversible damage to those beta cells. But the, the sort of take-home point from the entire discussion was if you get the fat out of yes. the pancreas soon enough, yeah. so if you have prediabetes and you act quickly, or you have type 2 diabetes for kind of you know, less than a decade and you, and you act and you get the fat out, a lot of the time there's enough beta cell function to actually get normal insulin secretion happening again. But where does he think that initial insulin, insulin resistance comes from? I asked him that question, mostly genetic. Right. So you can look at somebody who phenotypically their body, they, they look slim, you would never pick it, and they have glycemic issues. And then you reckon that it just starts this cascade where, you, like you mentioned, it's the feedback. Yeah, that, and that initial muscle insulin resistance piece, that was, for me, I was like super interested. Like, what's yeah. causing that? Yes. And is that, is, it, is that the fat in the muscle? Is that yeah, what? he thinks that there's a large genetic component to that. So even the, the intramyocellular lipids is genetic. And, and dietary. And, and a certain percentage, I guess, of the population are kind of sitting ducks. Mm. So in an, in, an, in an environment where there's not a positive energy balance, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right? Because it takes the positive energy balance to yes. create energy toxicity coupled gotcha, with the gotcha. muscle insulin resistance yeah. in order to then kickstart that twin cycle. Really interesting. Mate, I've lived that. I've lived that. What he just explained, what you just explained. Yeah. I've been through that literally on yeah. the multiple diets I've tried. Like I've seen this happen to me. What, ep- what was the episode number where we first walked oh, through that? Oh, jeez. Well, I can't remember. Gosh, it was maybe less than 100. I don't know. How many are on now? <laughs> we're nearly 300 wow. I'd like to go back and listen to that I don't <laughs> I don't no but I, I swear I've lived that so I had the for on the outside the body of somebody who you would never think has any insulin resistance or say poor insulin sensitivity but I experienced that liver that pouring out of glucose overnight my fasting gl- blood glucose was elevated my ability to get glucose into the muscle was like you know, postprandial after meals was not good, um, and then. But the thing is, in the beginning, when I was in a deficit, right, a calorie deficit, there was no problem. My numbers were great. It was four months later when that slight deficit went into a slight surplus is where I started to see these right. issues. And did that just go into a, a slight surplus just because naturally. you? It was a restrictive diet. It was, I was a restrictive hungry. diet. Yeah. You were hungry. I was overeating probably a little bit and. In the beginning, you're motivated and you're you're kind of sticking to it and you're feeling great. But then like four months later... Probably... I think that's a natural journey for a lot of people. Yeah, I would say so. There's kind of this assumption that that people that are adopting the low-carb or keto diet are in a deficit or at weight maintenance. Not all the time. Surely not. You've got to, you've got to fluctuate between the two. And I think that even seasonally, it will happen to everybody. Look what happens over the summer. You, you move more, you're outside more, and you probably eat less, skip meals or whatever. Winter, you're inside, you're sort of near the fridge, you're looking for those cozy, warm comfort foods, and you just you find yourself in a slight surplus. You know, we always, our bodies are going to change and our metabolism is going to change seasonally. And I think that if you're somebody like um, you were explaining here who's got that genetic predisposition and you're not thinking about this stuff, it's so easy to just accidentally eat in a surplus. And before you know it, as you mentioned, the liver starts to become insulin resistant. Insulin's not working at that site. Glucose is being poured out. It's getting converted into fat. And then it's just metabolic turmoil straight away. Yeah. And this also, this explains why you can have two people. It could be really frustrating for someone who is a little bit overweight, gets diagnosed with prediabetes. And then they look around mm. and their friends also overweight or maybe even more, more overweight yeah. and do not have prediabetes. Yeah, yeah. And Roy Taylor's work has kind of elucidated why this is the case. And it comes back to that genetic predisposition to muscle insulin resistance, yeah. but also to how well you can store fat subcutaneously. Yes. Because if you're someone who, from a, a genetic point of view, you can store a lot of fat subcutaneously, mm-hmm. well, when the liver is producing more of this fat and putting it into circulation, you can you can store that kind of relatively safely under the skin yes. as opposed to it going into the pancreas. Right. So it's almost like a more protective way of, of storing fat, subcut. You want, I mean, it probably doesn't look great. People care about that. But actually metabolically, perhaps it's better than storing more visceral fat. So, so the, I mean, just to close, close that one, 
if the insulin resistance starts at the muscle, because there are cases where the insulin resistance can be can actually start at the liver. Mm. Did you talk about that? No. Okay, because if you look at somebody who who sort of has an elevated fasting blood glucose, but after meals pro- postprandially, their glucose control is good. That is more of an indicator of liver insulin resistance. So basically what's happening is overnight, your liver is turning on that glucose tap, p- pushing glucose out because it has to try and maintain that homeostasis overnight. If insulin's not working at the liver, it can't turn the tap off. That's what insulin does at the liver. It says, hey, we're good. There's plenty of glucose around. You can stop pushing glucose out into the bloodstream. If it's not getting that message, it'll just keep pushing it out. You wake up in the morning, you have a high fasting blood glucose. Mm. That kind does that of- occur though if that person is insulin sensitive at the muscle? I think it can. I do. Th- I, this is why I'm fascinated by this sort of theory. I'm pro- probably more proven than that, but I'm pretty sure that if somebody has a meal, a high carbohydrate meal, and their postprandial blood glucose is completely normal, that indicates that that glucose went somewhere, right? Where does it usually go? What's the first site that we like muscle. to saw? Muscle. So it's telling you that their insulin sensitivity at the muscle, either they have normal insulin sensitivity there, or this is the part of the picture that we don't see, even if you wear a CGM, even if you try to look at these things, or they're hyper-secreting insulin, right? The pancreas is creating so much insulin, secreting so much insulin that it's getting, it's finding a way to sort of shove that glucose into muscle, right? So it doesn't necessarily tell you that you're insulin sensitive, but it does tell you that the glucose is getting into the muscle, right? So I think there are biomarkers that tell you the site specificity of the problem. I think fasting blood glucose is a pretty good one for telling you that maybe you're insulin resistant at the liver. And postprandial, if you've got normal blood glucose control, or let's say the opposite, if you have really bad postprandial blood glucose control, but you have normal fasting glucose levels, that may tell you that the insulin resistance is more at the muscle site. I'm not, it's not black and white. I wonder if you take a group of people with type 2 diabetes, what percentage of people have both of those mm. versus one of? Yeah, and, and which comes first? We also did speak about measuring insulin yeah and some of the problems with that and the wide sort of uh, reference range yeah the yeah. wide reference range and we spoke about uh, c peptide yeah which roy thinks is a, is a good marker yeah uh, for insulin sensitivity well insulin production production well both. Yeah, sorry insulin both. production both. c peptide yeah. tells you essentially how much insulin your body is making right. mine's a zero by the way yeah i make no insulin so that's the one of the first tests you get when you get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is a C-peptide to see early on how much like insulin fu- uh, pancreatic function do you have left. And if your C-peptide's zero, you're pretty much insulin dependent entirely from day one. Most people in their honeymoon phase, which again, worst word ever, why would you call it the honeymoon phase? But when you're diagnosed initially, some people have a bit of C-peptide left. Mm-hmm. And they think that then if you start insulin therapy early, you can preserve the pancreas function. So... Th- one of the, the sort of methods of treatment is get them on insulin straight away so the pancreas doesn't have to overuse their, their beta cells and then burn out and you'll have zero C-peptide and zero insulin production. Kind of a, it's a, People find that a little bit counterintuitive because a lot of people when they're first diagnosed, they think, no, I don't want to take insulin. I want to kickstart my pancreas to work on its own. But it seems to be that if you take insulin early, it does protect the pancreas in a way. But either way, at some point, that's why I hate the, the term the honeymoon phase. At some point, you're going to sort of grow out of it and then you, you've, you need to take insulin entirely. But C-peptide, yeah. So so what did he say about C-peptide? That it's a good, a good test to see I think he said it was your... a better test than testing fasting insulin. Interesting. More reliable. Mm. Did he say why? And easier for laboratories. I guess because the insulin... The insulin's not very stable, I think, during transport. And There's also, some problems with the assay. Right. And also, I think, um, I might be wrong about this, he can correct me. When you're measuring insulin in the bloodstream, you're only measuring the net effect. So what, what is the insulin left over? Some of the insulin has already done its job. It's attached to the receptors. It's opened the gateways to the cells. C-peptide is how much was produced, how much insulin was produced. It's that leftover. I don't know what happens to the C-peptide in the bloodstream. I don't know how the body metabolizes, metabolizes it. it after. It's a question for him. Um, anyway, that episode's coming out soon. Nice. And the take-home point, and I guess the... The hope that's provided from that episode is if you act soon enough and you you get enough fat out of the liver and pancreas, the vast majority of people can actually enter what's called remission. Yeah. So they can 
return to normal. This is people with type 2 diabetes I'm talking about here. They can return to normal blood glucose levels without blood glucose lowering medications. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning though that independent of weight loss, independent of all of this, a single bout of exercise can improve your glycemic control and open those glucose gateways independent of insulin. I wanted to ask you about this because at the end of the episode, I asked him, you know, I was thinking about his intervention. Mm -hmm. His intervention is a 12-week, very low-calorie diet yep. that's high protein, mm -hmm. but 800 calories a day, yeah. plus some non-starchy vegetables. Yeah. Um, I think in the direct trial, it was just 800 calories a day. And then since then, some of the more recent trials, he's added non-starchy vegetables, yeah. probably to help with adherence. And people lose, you know, in that 12-week period, so, some, of, some of the subjects in the study where people had a, were overweight or o obese, they lost on average 15 kilograms. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, are you, are you worried about the percentage of that weight that would be lean mass, loss of muscle, given how critical muscle is to blood glucose control. Yeah. He didn't seem that concerned because I, my question to him was, do you think there'd be even better results of remission at two years and five years if you were to couple this with resistance training? Yeah. And I think his, his kind of main thoughts were that exercise increases appetite yeah. and you really don't want to be doing anything that's going to affect that ability for that person to lose sure. a significant amount of weight. But exercise also has an expenditure, cal caloric expenditure to it. So is he saying it's too easy to out eat that expenditure through those hunger cravings? Yeah. I think, and I think he kind of, he reeled off a couple of studies that have maybe shown that. Yeah, that does happen. But also like, I, th I think in, in non, in different population groups, generally speaking for everybody sort of listening, if you don't have diabetes and you like to exercise, chances are, yes, you'll out eat some of those calories later, but you're still getting like 70% of the calories, but it's not like you're eating all of them back, right? Like that extra hunger. You're not just going to eat way above, you know, being a surplus. Otherwise, pretty much everyone who exercised would gain weight. Mm. It's just not what, not really what happens. You do you do account for some of it, maybe like 30%, but I don't think it's that big. Obviously, you know my thoughts on this. Like I think a bigger muscle, bigger sponge, more glycogen storage capacity. We know that insulin sensitivity and GLUT4 translocation, so the opening of those gateways is site-specific. Mm. If you're not contracting the muscle, that is the only way to get that non-insulin mediated uptake of glucose. You've got to contract the muscle. And if you think back to the start of that twin cycle hypothesis, positive energy balance plus mm. muscle insulin, insulin resistance. Right. That, so so if you have a genetic predisposition, it's not that you, you can't affect it. Right. Like right. you could still, even though genetically you might have a, a greater degree of insulin resistance to sure. the next person, yeah. that's not saying that you you cannot improve insulin sensitivity in the muscle through exercise. In fact, what that's saying is probably the best place to start is to address the muscle tissue. Contract your muscles. So resistance training can be body weight. It can be weights. It can be any form of resistance. The muscle doesn't care what, what you're holding in your hand. Is it a dumbbell? Is it a chin up? It doesn't care. It's contraction mediated. The more muscle you can contract, the more of those glucose gateways you open up. Right. And you're more sensitive to insulin, which means that one key can open sort of more doors rather than having like hundreds of keys floating around to just get, hopefully one works in a single door. You're more sensitive to insulin. And another crazy thing, when you look at untrained versus trained subjects who do a, an acute bout of exercise, the trained subjects who do it consistently have a better sensitivity response to insulin from the single bout of exercise than the untrained. Exact same workout. If you're untrained, you get some insulin sensitivity, but if you're trained, your body reacts even better. So consistency is another big piece of it. So that's why I would think if somebody, if the hypothesis is true that the insulin resistance starts at the side of the muscle, I would be saying first thing you need to do is contract your muscles often and try to get them bigger. That, that would be my sort of recommendation. I'd like to see a, a long-term randomized controlled trial done where it's you have a control group, you have the very low calorie diet intervention, and then you have very low calorie diet or calorie restriction plus resistance training. Right. 
and do things to manipulate the diet to make it high protein. Yes. So do whatever you can from a nutrition point of view to kind of preserve muscle mass in the context of a calorie deficit. Right. And perhaps built into that algorithm is the energy expended in your workout, you can eat back Mm-hmm. To that degree. So maybe it's like they, they get an extra 250 calories a day based on what they burnt in their resistance training workout for 30 or 40 minutes so that it's energy matched. That'd be interesting. You could play around with so many neat interventions because it could be that you do a full body resistance training workout twice a week. Right. At five days calorie restrict and on those two days eat more calories. Go for it, yeah. Yeah, where well, your body's more receptive to, you know, to- more tolerant to the glucose that's coming in. Again, I mean, t- ties back to that first study you, you explained, right? Where it's the weekend warrior. If you're somebody with this condition, I don't think being a weekend warrior is going to be optimal. I really don't. It just you've got to stimulate that muscle daily. And it doesn't have to be a resistance training every day. Like a walk is good too. Um, it's just got to be something. And I, I think that if you just try to do all your workout on, on, on a Saturday or a Sunday or both, what happens on those days that you're eating high carbohydrate meals and you're not priming your body to either utilize it or improve insulin sensitivity on a meal to meal basis? I think we should be thinking about our metabolic health and our physiology on a meal to meal basis if you're somebody with glycemic control issues. Like a, a walk after meals is so simple, yeah. works so well. 15 minute walk. Right, which is even when you're getting down to that level, it's, it's not just making sure you're moving every day. Because you can sit down for 12 hours a day right. and do exactly. one hour of exercise at the end of your work day, exactly. which is different to kind of having interspersed exercise snacks or yes. movement after each meal, yeah. sprint throughout the we day. We spoke about a study a while back. I don't know, I can't remember what episode it was, but it was comparing over the course of a day, an hour of workout versus six hours of standing versus 14 hours of sitting like what the best outcomes were. And basically that one hour workout was not an invitation to sit down all day. In fact, the group that stood and sort of walked at low intensity for longer did better. So yeah, I mean, you've got to look at how many waking hours have we got? What are you going to do with them? Structured exercise, great, tick that box. But outside of that, it's not an invitation to just be sedentary. That it doesn't offset sitting down all day. You still got to- I love the idea of movement snacks. Yeah, yeah, so good. You did a couple, we did a couple in Bali. Yeah, but just finding a way every 45 minutes or hour at work yeah, just to have a break for five minutes and move the body. 100%. Yeah. Okay, coming back to that study yeah, yeah, yeah. on on plant-based diets, aerobic oh, that's right. performance <laughs> that's strength, because you, you mentioned yeah. that there are some things that can go wrong. So I think quickly oh, yeah. we can just reel off what some of those might be. So to, just to remind people because we've kind of digressed for about 30 minutes there. So that meta-analysis found there was no significant significant differences between a plant-based diet and omnivorous diets for strength and power, mm-hmm. which, as I said, I think is a win for plant-based diets yep. because it's generally kind of assumed that you're going to have reductions in strength or power. Yep. You know, people will, would attribute that to less protein yeah. or less bioavailable protein, things like that. Um, and then in that study, they found a, a, a modest improvement in aerobic performance with the plant-based diet. Where could a plant-based diet potentially go wrong or, or what should people focus on? If someone's listening and thinking, okay, that's great, that's really comforting, I want to start to make some changes here. Mm. What are some of the potential nutrients of focus or blind spots mm. i think total energy is one was, that for me was going to be the first off the bat that's <laughs> what i did wrong yeah i was in such a deficit accidentally I, just this is what happens when you eat a whole food plant-based diet is your caloric density goes down and and this is the thing any diet when you're in a deficit especially 300 plus calories a day deficit i don't care if you're eating only meat when you lose that much weight you start to get a little bit weaker you get weaker, you get, weaker, you get tired, sluggish. fatigue. I mean, it, your testosterone will go down a little bit. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not what it's not the plants, it's the deficit. So knowing what is your maintenance of, of calories that you need to try hit and how to get them is very How important. did you navigate that in terms of finding ways to consume more calories without being like crazy bloated? Right. So I, I had to start to add more calories 
like calorie dense foods to my smoothies. So like nuts. more seeds and nuts and peanut butter. And then I was putting a little bit more olive oil on my salads and, and then a protein powder. Cause I was trying to get all my protein from chickpeas and legumes. You know, I was bloated all the time. Um, yeah. Finding some low fiber, high protein yeah, options. Yeah. Which I, in the beginning I was like against because I was trying to stick to that label of whole food, plant-based eat real food in its natural form, nothing processed. Like I was meticulous about that. I think that let me down. Yeah, and that's that becomes more difficult if you have performance related goals and you're a you're someone who is highly active, so you eat a lot of calories. Yeah. Because then the absolute amount of fiber is really high. Yeah. And B, with those performance goals, if you're trying to target a high protein intake mm. at one point five, one point six grams right. per kilogram, that that kind of uh, ability to get all of those calories from whole foods and feel comfortable. Right. Is Especially much early on when you first transition and your gut just isn't, it's just not equipped to handle that amount of fiber. That's what I did wrong. I went from eating no legumes for seven years to eating cans per day, multiple cans. And I was just, I was in so much discomfort and my digestion probably sucked as well, which is why I was losing weight. Yeah. I used yeah. to think it was a problem to have kind of plant-based meat alternatives no, in the diet. I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm completely, I mean, I look I look at the nutrition label Same. and I'm looking for ones that are not very high in saturated fat because you can find some and they just load it with coconut oil. Right. They taste great, yeah. but they might have 20 grams of saturated fat in a yeah. surf. Yeah. I literally saw 20 in a surf. <laughs> one product wow. the other day. I won't name names. And I've had that product before and it, it does taste great, but <laughs> I'm sure that's- Is it mushroom based? <laughs> that's I think not I might Do know the one. It's not Dr. Thomas Day Spring approved. <laughs> I think I might know the one. <laughs> yeah, it's it is it's a great tasting product yeah. and I know why a lot of places are using it. It's a mushroom. It's very high in saturated very, fat. Very, very meaty no, mushroom. No, no clues, it. no clues. Uh, anyway, that's like a sometimes food for me, rare occasions, if I want to indulge. Sure, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's poison. I don't think it's going to kill you. I just think if I was eating it every day, I would go and do my blood work yeah. and APOB would be probably <laughs> north of 120, 130 yeah. and I'd rather it below 80. Right. Uh, I look at saturated fat. I look at the sodium content. That's yes. the second one yes. that I like to look at. Again, I I think 300 to 400 milligrams of sodium in a serve is, is like, that's really good if you can find that. Mm -hmm sort of five, 600 milligrams is, you know, in the, in the middle of perhaps acceptable, particularly yeah. if you're not having it three times a day, mm -hmm. but you might find some falafel, for example. Oh. <laughs> Do you know how thirsty I am the day They after might have falafel. 1,400 or 1,500 yeah. milligrams of sodium yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. in one serve. So you have to be really careful yeah. with some of those, particularly if you have high blood pressure. Yeah. Um, now I don't have high blood pressure, but I still I still like to kind of choose the ones that are middle of the road, yeah. five hundred milligrams of sodium or less. Saturated fat, I'm looking for five grams or less yeah. in a in a serve. Mm -hmm. But those plant based meat alternatives that meet that criteria, because usually they are much lower in fiber and volume compared to if you were getting the same amount of protein from legumes. Sure. They're a nice addition within a diet that has legumes. Yeah. It's not that yeah, you're yeah, yeah. removing black beans and lentils. Like I eat heaps of those right. tempeh, but you can kind of supplement the diet with these plus or minus a protein isolate. Speaking of protein isolate, that one that we had at the retreat was oh, really, was really good. Yeah, uh, brought it back. Shout, shout out to to uh, White Wolf. White Wolf, they hooked us up. They and did. We were pro. We had this is not zero. A paid, this is not, not a paid, paid ad. Paid ad, but zero protein deficiency on our retreats. I'll tell you what. I've always used White Wolf for yeah. years now. The flavor is great. <sighs> so, anyway, protein. Yeah. Um. So total energy. And sorry, just to go back on that. When you're eating those plant-based meats, do you care about this? Like, is it soy? Is it microprotein? Is it lupin? Is it? Do you do you look for that, or do you just look at macronutrients. I don't care so much other than I try and have variation, variety, and yep. diversity. Yep. So I'm not just buying the exact same one every time and eating right. that three times a day. Yep. I would like to have exposure to soy, to yeah, lupin, seitan, seitan yep. and um, I think that's the best bet yep. rather than kind of putting all your eggs into one basket. Yeah. 
And each of them have slightly different nutritional profiles and right. different amounts of unsaturated fats. And some of them add certain micronutrients to them and some don't. Mm. Um, I don't really get bogged down in that too much. I'm, I'm literally looking at saturated fat, sodium, um, the practical application. Does it have the texture I'm looking for and does it taste good? Yeah. Do I enjoy it? Those are the kind of big things, and then I just mix it up. I find, you know, three or four or five of those that are kind of go-tos, mm. and I'll buy them and sort of integrate them on a weekly basis. Right, and again, just going back to why we even started talking about that, if you're trying to eat that amount of protein, say 25 grams in chickpeas, I mean, that's got to be like five cans of chickpeas just to hit 25 grams, right? And if you've got resistance training goals, muscle building goals... It just, I think there's more practical ways of hitting your protein requirements. And a lot of people will, you know, immediately without even looking at the studies, just assume that these are, are really bad, bad for your for health. You. Yeah, you hear right, that all the compared time. Compared to meat. But there are studies that have looked at that. Right. And so I'm comfortable with them based on the nutritional profile. The fact that when you have them instead of a typical kind of equivalent meat product, mm. you are exposing yourself to less saturated fat you're still exposing yourself to a little bit more fiber because yep. they do contain some fiber um, often they can have more potassium and the studies that have looked at these like the swap meat trial you see improvements in blood lipids and you don't see a deleterious effect on blood pressure which people might assume because you know there is this idea out there that in order to make them taste good you have to add tons of sodium mm -hmm. and there is a little bit more sodium in these products if you compare them to the meat alternative sure. but most people when they're consuming their meat add salt exactly so right. when you when you compare these foods as people would consume them you don't see a significant difference in blood pressure and within the context of a very plant heavy diet there's evidence showing that the plants are protective even if you're eating red meat right yeah. to a certain degree so why can't that same thing apply to a plant-based meat alternative in the context of a very plant-heavy diet with heaps of diversity? I don't see any reason why it's you know, a problem, especially for long-term health. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, all of this has to just be considered within the context of your biomarkers. Yeah. You know, where is your ApoB at? Where is your right. blood pressure at? Right. All these sorts of things. But I, I think they have their place in a healthy plant-rich plant-based dietary pattern particularly for the athlete with a high energy requirement mm -hmm. and a high protein requirement yeah that and wants to feel comfortable sure and this isn't even taking into account the social aspect of it being being vegan or plant-based in a very car carnivorous world like if we, if you have an option that you can bring to the barbecue that's not meat and it tastes really good and it looks like meat and every the same experience that could be another great time to incorporate into your diet just socially it takes the pressure off showing up to the party with a can of lentils. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they've been unfairly demonized. I think so, yeah. Uh, the other ones, the other nutrients to, that would be good for an athlete, particularly a, an athlete um, that's doing a lot of endurance work, would be iron. So athletes in general have a higher iron requirement. You um, lose iron through sweat, there's inflammation associated you with lose exercise. Iron through sweat. Yeah, I did not know that. And when you have more inflammation, wow. the body requires more iron. There's there's obviously an inflammatory response to exercise. Uh, and then also, what's interesting is actually the foot striking the ground. Yes. And the the red blood cells that are flowing through the foot at that time can become damaged. Yes, I've heard. And that, that can actually. Uh, cause a condition called runner's anemia. Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah, the heel striking over Foot and strike over. hemolysis or right. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you're someone that has a lot of a lot of kind of heel striking, but it also can occur in resistance training, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all of this can kind of coalesce to a higher requirement for iron. Yep. But you would go and get your iron tested. Right. And you look at serum ferritin and if that's below 30 milligrams per liter, then that is kind of indicative of iron deficiency. Mm -hmm. And in that instance, if, if an athlete or anyone had less than 30 milligrams per deciliter, 30 milligrams per liter for serum ferritin, then that's when you would consider a supplement. Okay. It's like 40 to 60 
milligrams of elementary iron. Right. Would you would you say that iron supplementation similar to creatine is just a do no harm, may as well take it or no? no? I think you'd have to test first. Okay. Is because here's the other thing. Elevations in serum ferritin can increase risk of certain chronic diseases, okay. cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. In fact, one of the papers I want to speak about is red meat and risk of type 2 diabetes. Mm-hmm. And one of the proposed mechanisms by which red meat might affect risk of type 2 diabetes is through the elevation of iron status okay. from heme iron, which is rapidly absorbed. Right. Now, I think you... You wouldn't just go out and sort of prophylactically take an iron supplement, a high yeah, dose. Right. I mean, if it's small, if it's like, like a multi, five like to a eight general milligrams. Multi, yeah, if it's in a multi, that's okay. I don't think that's a problem. Right. But that's that that input amount is not going to take someone out of, from a deficiency to a, to a normal uh, optimal status. Okay. Right? These yeah. are two different things. If yeah. you're below 30 milligrams per deciliter, you need about 40 to 60 milligrams mm-hmm. of elemental iron okay. per day to kind of get you back into a healthy um, healthy range for serum ferritin, which is iron storage. It's yeah. indicative of your iron stores. Right. Uh, and if you were to do that, then you would wait sort of six or eight weeks at least. Right. You know, to, to retest. Maybe a little bit longer, probably probably three or four months actually. Right. Based on the red blood cell. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. Okay. And that... That that is a potential blind spot, and there are studies looking at VO two max in um, athletes who have healthy serum ferritin versus suboptimal or iron deficiency. Mm-hmm. And VO two max goes down if you have iron deficiency yeah. because iron plays an important role in the the carriage of oxygen, yeah, supply of oxygen to muscles. Mm. And most people, when they do a blood test, you're getting iron. Ferritin, like there's there's not just one thing you're looking at, right? Yeah, yeah you can, well, serum iron, there's ferritin, right. um, transferrin, transferrin saturation, all of these things. Um, then hemoglobin you're going to look at as well to yeah. see if it's iron deficiency with anemia right. or without anemia. Um, serum ferritin is where you would start. Okay. And then you'd work with your physician or dietitian to kind of peel back the layers a little bit more. Mm. Um, but generally speaking, if you're below 30 milligrams per liter for serum ferritin, that's when you would consider supplementation. Okay. There are also um, you know, certain things you want to rule out, like inflammatory conditions yeah. and, and whatnot, that I think people need to do on an individual basis with their physician. Mm. Um, but once you've ruled out any type of inflammatory like bowel disease, sure. then you would look to, you know, di- dietary modifications mm-hmm. can be helpful, but often if serum ferritin is extremely low, it requires a supplement mm-hmm. uh, or, or an iron transfusion. Yeah, I, I've, I've been sort of following my ferritin levels over the years since being plant-based, and I think it has trended down a little bit. It's certainly not like, I'm not anemic or anything. But I, I have noticed a downward trend, and I wonder, is it to the point where I need to start thinking about supplementing, or because I, I I really don't think I can do any better with my diet currently. I think I eat a really really responsible plant based diet. I'm focusing on iron rich foods, lots I'm of legumes, them, yeah, lots of legumes. I'm trying to pair them with, you know, enhances of the absorption of them and all of that kind of stuff. If somebody's in that position, they feel like they're doing everything right. And they still have this sort of downward trend, not to the point of being like pathological by any means, but sort of heading in that direction maybe. Keep an eye on it and yeah. see if you go, go below 30 milligrams right. per liter yeah. for serum ferritin, yeah. which would be indicative of a deficiency. Yeah. But most of the literature suggests that while heme iron is more bioavailable, mm-hmm. There isn't an increased incidence of iron deficiency in plant-based folks, oh, right. not in Western countries, right? right? Um, and there's a couple of kind of um, proposed explanations for this. One is that as as the body has less um, iron available through the diet, it can increase the amount that's absorbed. Yeah. So there's this like kind of compensatory gotcha. effect. Um, but I would say... You should keep an eye yeah. on serum ferritin, yeah. and if it was to go below thirty milligrams per liter, yeah. then you would want to consider a supplement. Yeah, 
And you would also want to keep an eye on hemoglobin as well. Sure. You yeah, know, I've got a good doctor, mum. <laughs> Look after me. <laughs> Sweet. What else? Yeah. What else do people work, like, should be focusing on if they go to this plant? B12 diet? as well. Yeah. And that's also important for the supply of oxygen to, to muscle. Um, DHA and EPA. Mm-hmm. We've spoken a lot about this. Yep. Um, but I mean, there's, there's, Emerging evidence that DHA and EPA could be playing an important role in um, the preservation of muscle tissue and actually the building of new muscle tissue. Um, so increasing muscle protein synthesis, reducing muscle protein breakdown. So I think supplementing with an algae oil and, and trying to get in that one gram a day um, ballpark is, is probably sensible. I mean, we presented some research on the retreat looking at a much higher dose, two to three grams a day, that was able to kind of attenuate muscle loss in, in people that were sort of bedridden, mm-hmm. which I think is an interesting area of, of research. Um, now, two to three grams per day of DHA and EPA is a lot, and you wouldn't want to do that if you had cardiovascular disease and you or atri- atrial fibrillation or you were you know at risk of bleeding. Yep. Then you would want to speak to your physician before having a high dose DHA, EPA, fish oil, or algae, algae oil. And I don't think the average person needs to be thinking about two or three grams a day. You know, maybe if you're someone who is in your 50s or 60s and you're bedridden like in those studies and you need to do everything possible to protect the muscle there's some evidence that that could be helpful Mm -hmm. from an athlete point of view i think that one gram a day that philip calder said is probably sensible creatine you mentioned yep so lots of evidence that that can be beneficial for muscle mass so increasing lean mass strength which we've spoken about and that for that outcome it's three to five grams a day in that ballpark and you can just start that three or five grams from day one and by about a month in your cells will be saturated yeah so that's when you'll start to experience the full benefits of it yeah or you can do a loading phase of anywhere between 20 or 30 grams per day yeah. for like a week right. and then you will you will have saturated the cells really quickly and then you switch to that three or five grams a day and some people going. are non-responders and right. responders yeah that's th- that i find really interesting i feel a huge effect of creatine i mean in, in bali i was like begging you for some and you thankfully you dropped some at my door but like I really respond well to it i feel the difference physically my performance in the gym is is completely different I, I absolutely love it and swear by it, but there's other people, I think Rooney even mentioned, he's a non-responder. Yeah. And he, he did a lab test to figure this out. They check biopsy of muscle. And despite going on a loading phase, it doesn't saturate in the muscle of some people. And I, I don't know why. I think there's probably a genetic element to that as well. But mm. for those- I'll like, ask Darren. Yeah, yeah, ask Darren. That's I'll a good one. add that to my list. Um, but I, I would be interested to see why some people respond so well to creatine and others don't at all. And, and I'm, I believe there was some research in creatine intake in people who are plant-based seeing more ergogenic effects than in people who aren't. I, again, I don't know why. Yeah, and that makes sense because you your body produces about one gram a day. Yeah. And the average omnivore will get one gram a day through their diet. Yeah, right. Whereas people consuming vegetarian or vegan diets are getting much less or, yeah. or zero. Right. So you're making up that slight little deficit there. Yeah. So there might be about a gram a day difference in Which may in be, intake. Yeah. You might feel the difference with that. Who knows? Right. Mm. That said, the the kind of clinically effective dose or where you see the maximum benefit is at that three or five grams a day. So no matter if you're an omnivore or a vegetarian, right. you're likely to benefit from supplementation. It's funny that creatine isn't prescribed on a per kilo basis because like you're thinking about it it's it's where's where is it going muscle tissue right muscle cells mostly it should be on a per kilogram of lean, lean mass, mass that's what i was thinking basis All right so you should you should sort of if you want to because for, for you to take a three to five gram dose and then you know somebody's grandma very different bodies very different amount of muscle you would think that the dose would be dependent on the, on the lean mass but well to be fair i think that's it's a 
a translation of the science into a kind of more accessible format. Okay. A lot of the studies do look at like 0.1 grams per kilogram right. per day or 0.13 or 0.14. Yeah. And I think it just becomes more um, easy for people to kind of comprehend right. when you say, here's the grams yeah, yeah. to take this and here's a serve. range, yeah. three to five. Most people probably fall between three and five yeah. when you when you calculate it out. Yeah, true. Um, but if you're someone that has a really high lean body mass, a lot of muscle tissue, then you might want to be mm. having a little bit more than that. And I guess the the other thing to note here is there are studies looking at 20 to 30 grams a day and not seeing deleterious effects on kidney or liver function. Mm. And some of the studies looking at um, and well, bone we mentioned before, those are dosing at like seven to ten grams a day. Yeah. Some of the cognitive studies that are emerging are looking at twenty grams a day. Mm. Um, so if you wanted to have you know seven ten grams a day to be on the safe side, if you had a lot of muscle mass, then I don't think that's a bad idea. Yeah. The other one's taurine. Mm -hmm. Have you ever supplemented with taurine? I've never. No. Either have I, but I'm considering really? considering it. Yeah, okay. it's a conditionally essential amino acid, and vegetarians tend to have lower levels okay. of taurine. And what is its role? So there might be some upside here. Um, it's been shown in clinical studies to improve strength and to reduce muscle damage after eccentric loading. Okay. It doesn't reduce inflammation, but it seems to somehow reduce muscle damage. Uh, coupled with an improvement in strength, and in those studies, they were they were using fifty milligrams per kilogram per day. Okay. So for a seventy kilo person, that's about three point five grams mm -hmm. of taurine, okay. which is an it's an amino acid. Right. Now our, our body can make it, but it's considered conditionally essential, and as I said, vegetarians tend to have lower levels of this. So it might be something that you know someone who's consuming a vegetarian or completely whole food plant-based diet might want to consider. Right. This is like if you're getting the towel and you're really yeah, squeezing, squeezing out, the last, out here, yeah. the, the last few drops. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think there's an issue with deficiency. Again, it's similar to creatine Yeah. where we're talking more about optimization. Yeah, so even if you don't take creatine and you're plant-based, you're still most likely going to be pretty healthy and you're going to perform fine in the gym. We're just talking about that extra 1% to 2%, maybe 5%. And the comforting thing is in these studies where they're comparing aerobic performance and strength and power, to my knowledge, these are not plant-based athletes that are supplementing with creatine and with taurine. Right. And they're not even necessarily people who are, uh, are hyper-focusing on iron and B12 and EPA and DHA and their total energy. Mm -hmm. So... The fact that there is a modest improvement in aerobic performance and yeah. you're not seeing any any differences in strength and power uh, in a group of people that probably aren't even that dialed in, mm -hmm. I think is really reassuring because you can, you may be able to get, there might be m more benefits off of grabs that we can't see. Yeah, that's a good point. By fine tuning this further. Very good point. And what's probably not spoken about enough or maybe it is, but the focus seems to be on these nutrients and supplements, is the stimulus. What is the, what is the physical stimulus that you're putting on through, through your body every day? I don't care what diet you're on. If you're not doing the resistance training, you can eat all the protein in the world and you're not going to gain much muscle, right? If you're not doing the cardiovascular training, you're not going to improve your heart health. So go to get the stimulus right. And then on top of that, then you might f find some benefits with these supplement protocols and dietary patterns. But you've got to get the stimulus in there. Not many people focus on that. They sort of look for the easier thing, which is what you're eating three times a day rather than putting in the work. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Okay, just to recap that, if you're thinking of transitioning to a plant-based diet or you already have and you're wanting to kind of optimize for performance, total energy, mm -hmm. make sure you're getting enough calories. Mm -hmm. We spoke about some strategies, trying to incorporate the calorie-dense kind of nuts and seeds and um, nut and seed butters, avocado, yep. that's another great one, dried fruit, granola, 
and some of those lower fiber, high protein foods. Protein, so trying to get to 1.6 grams per kilogram as a daily target is a pretty good goal. Just saw a study recently that compared 1.6 to 3.2 and no significant differences. So it doesn't seem like there's huge advantages to dialing it up way above 1.6. Um, iron, so test your serum ferritin, see where you're at. There are dietary strategies where you can include more iron-rich plant foods and couple them with sources of vitamin C, like you said, or garlic and onion, which will increase absorption. There's a supplement if you're deficient. B12, that's 50 to 250 micrograms a day, mm-hmm. or 2,000 to 2,500 micrograms a week as a supplement. DHA and EPA, um, algae oil, around one gram a day. Creatine, three to five um, grams per day. And then perhaps consider taurine. Something I'm going to play around with. So you buy it as an ind- individual amino acid? Just buy it as a powder. And just add it to a smoothie. I'm not sure how it tastes. I know some of these amino acids. Oh, mate. Do I remember not. popping op- open a. Uh, you ever tried was lucine? It? Lucine. That's what it was. <laughs> hey, that made me vomit. Be careful. I actually vomited. Yeah, it's disgusting. It is disgusting. So it might be one that you need to blend and kind of hide in There's a. There's another one. So smoothie. hold on. L- lucine, I remember tasting like old socks like it was the worst thing ever but there was another one that's like literally fish it smells like fish what's the amino acid that's very prevalent in fish come that's on a good question come on you, you've got this uh, it's glycine that, it's one of those one of those don't buy it on its own <laughs> that is the worst it, it just the smell the t- oh my god i remember i used to like try to optimize my leucine remember when yeah. the leucine popped onto the scene in sports science it was like you got to hit two grams so i started adding two grams to everything wasn't worth it. I don't even think it made a difference, to be honest, at all. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. Hey, by the way, just just on that note, so you were just saying, okay, if you go to a plant-based diet and you're interested in your performance, those are the things to think about. I was just watching Dan Buettner's show on Netflix, How to Live to 100 or Live to 100. The Blue Zone. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great documentary. Part of the upside of the plant-based diet is the low caloric nature of it. So for people who want to maintain a healthy body weight for years and years effortlessly, a plant-based diet it seems to be quite a, an easy way to access that, right? So I think that if you are somebody listening and you're thinking, I want to go plant-based, should I be eating the nut butters, the olive oils in huge amounts, adding all of these things, the dried fruit? If weight loss is your goal, no. Like we just, I want right. to be clear on that yes. because you can also really easily be in a huge caloric surplus if you're eating tons of dried fruit, tons of nut butters, all of these things that we were just mentioning. So I think that knowing your goal is important and, and the, maybe the hierarchy of your goals because some people have weight loss is a goal, but performance is also a goal or maybe they want to be stronger, but they also want to lose body fat. I think you, you need to prioritize which one you want to attack first because if you just go into it as thinking, you know, I want to lift more weights in the gym, I want to gain muscle, it helps to be in a slight surplus if you want to gain muscle, but it doesn't help you lose body fat if you want to, if you're in a slight surplus, right? So, what is your priority? Set your hierarchy, your personal hierarchy. If you want to lose weight, don't worry about all these things we were just saying. You know, don't worry about the nut butters and the yeah. Oils. And this study actually also looked at BMI, and right. even though, so they. In their conclusion, they say that, you know these plant-based diets do not jeopardize strength and power performance, despite the fact that subjects tended to have a reduction in their BMI. Right. Yes. And so I think this this is a point that should not be lost on on people. Uh, around ninety percent of the population by like 2040, 2050 in America at least will be overweight or obese. So in in a very obesogenic environment. This is perhaps one of the biggest benefits of, of a plant-based dietary pattern, that it will help people you know, reduce their BMI, which is a massive risk factor for cardiometabolic disease. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you can do that and not have a reduction or a negative deleterious effect on your strength right. and on your power, that's something for us to celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Double win. And an improvement potentially on your aerobic performance at the same time, which is probably through improvement in cardiovascular function. Right. I mean, and that's not to say, because I can just hear the people who've 
watch the game changes. They're like, yeah, but you can also do all of this not on a plant-based diet. Yeah, that's true. But if the dietary pattern is plant predominant, you're setting yourself up for success. Even if you want to eat some fish or a little bit of meat, mm. I think just having a predominantly plant-based diet is a really good foundational point to yeah. start. Have you seen the the Nordic, uh, the Danish dietary guidelines? New, newly come out? Yeah. I think you spoke about it at the retreat. Yeah, I put it yes. up on the screen yes. in the last Similar workshop. Similar to Canada's sort of guidelines. I'm going to put that into the show notes for this episode. Yeah. Because that's, I think, the best dietary guidelines at a country level for people to refer to. Do you think it's on and par with there's, Canada? There's room in there for some animal uh, foods, but it's it's very plant-rich. In fact, they use the language plant-rich. Yeah. They say uh, plant-rich. What's the, they, they take Michael Pollan's quote and they right. adapt it. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Though. Yeah, eat plant-rich um uh, not too much or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a focus on the serving and how much you're eating as well. Right. And that comes again. But Dan Butner did a great job on, in the in the documentary of explaining. You'll remember the name of this, but basically the the, the name for eating to eighty percent full to not like going mm -hmm. to, to whatever that was. There was yeah, eat plant rich, varied, and not too much. Varied. Yes. So again, diversity, plant diversity, not too much meaning obviously not too much in volume and serving, but that also equates to not too many calories and energy. energy. And it's just such sensible guidelines. They have a really nice graphic. Eat plant-rich, varied and not too much. Eat more vegetables and fruit. Eat less meat. Choose legumes and fish. Right. Eat whole grain foods. Choose vegetable oils and low-fat dairy products. Choose vegetable oils. Oof. Eat less sweet, salty, and fatty food. Yep. Thirsty, drink water. Yeah, simple. It is simple. when, like All of this is simple when you boil it down, but... In the environment we live in, it's hard. That's the problem. Like the, when I was watching this Blue Zone doco, I was like, it's so easy to live to 100. Move into nature, <laughs> live on the coast, walk upstairs and hills. You don't even have to do that much resistance training. Do your gardening. Don't have too much furniture in your house. Eat a lot of plants, diversity, and spend time with people you love. Someone asked me but the like, other day. It's not that easy to access <laughs> in this do world. Do you think we overcomplicate things? Yes. When and then I thought that, about it and I thought, am I contributing to that we are by a little bit. digging into all these studies we are and a bit. you know is it a case of would everyone just be better if they literally took those seven bullet points that i just mentioned yeah find the variation within that that leaves you kind of feeling the best and works for you from a cultural cultural point of view and geographic point of view yeah. taste point of view enjoyment so you can adhere to it yeah. and stop thinking about nutrition <laughs> no is the answer. I'll tell you why that doesn't work. Because a lot of people do that and still run into these hurdles and that's where you, you have to dig a bit deeper. So it's like, yes, I did all that, but my ferritin is going down or my performance has changed in the gym. That's when you want to get this extra bit of, you know, 5 percenters here and there. So, okay, so I'm not you know, out of a do, job. No, you're doing a fantastic job. <laughs> I think that sometimes as well, but then I, I understand that there are millions of people who are doing the... This, what you just mentioned there is a great just blanket public health foundational right. measure for the majority of the population. I guess the the more important thing here would be if you're not doing those things, forget about all the podcasts and all right. the things that are going into the weeds. Yeah. Go away, get all of those in play yes. first. Yes. And then take that next step to, to jumping into a bit of the minutiae and, right. and getting a little more granular on specific, you know, supplements that you might exactly. be taking and, um, you know, trying to change the amount of carbs in your diet or yes. fats, things like that. And back to one of the themes of our retreat, test, retest. So do all that, get it all right, do, the, do your best to follow those guidelines, then do the tests. Okay, what are my biomarkers? Am I in an optimal zone here? If not, what can I do about it? And that's when I think getting granular and digging up studies can help people. And I, I know it's helped me in, in many ways. Like even just the simple recommendation about my changing my B12 from whatever the fuck it was called, methyl. Uh, you were on uh, methylcobalamin and to and cyanico. And straight away, my B12 improved in my biomarkers. But I was doing all the, just all the foundational stuff was good. I was following that blue zone life, but just that, that little bit of granular, one misstep and, and you might be out of range and then you just fix that up and you can improve your health so no i don't think we're overdoing it i think that maybe we need to <laughs> focus more on the less sexy messaging mm. which is the foundational stuff right so in the show notes 
anyone that wants to look through the Danish official dietary guidelines, you'll find a link there and you can click that. It's a really nice, simple PDF. Go through that. And I think that should be, mm. that. that's like the first step. If someone's just oh, confused sure. about their diet, get that in play. Like you said, do that for several months, mm. measure your, um, do some bloods at the start, do some bloods once you've been eating like that for yeah. a couple of months. And then go from there. But then I, I think about this, right? I'm watching this Blue Zone documentary and I'm thinking these people are over 100 years old and thriving, like proper, like riding horses and gardening and doing heavy lifting and chopping wood. If you tested their blood, I bet you they're not perfect with their biomarkers either. So how much do these perfect biomarkers actually influence your longevity and health span when it comes to the if you've got all the other big levers in place, right? So they eat a lot of fiber, they got a great diet, they have incredible community, you know, connection and quality relationships, and they live in nature and they're not breathing in pollution every day. I think though, if you were to look on average, like things like APOB or LDL cholesterol, their fasting blood glucose, HbA1c, be pretty good. I think they would be much better than right. than than the average person right now in the Western yeah. country. And I think if you adopted the Danish dietary guidelines or something similar, you would shift more towards a, a blue zone right. type dietary pattern. Mm. And with that, you would see improvements in blood pressure, um, improvements in blood lipids, glycemic control that would shift you more towards the um, the blood pressure and the blood lipids and glycemic control of people in those blue zones. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, body weight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the other thing that I've just observed by looking at the people who are living to 100 is, number one, none of them are overweight or obese. Number two, and this one's a bit weird, hear me out here, none of them are tall, right? You never see and a, they're not bodybuilders. a six foot eight, 100 year old, right? And I wonder if also that there's something to do with just genetically, and I'm sorry if you're <laughs> seven foot or more, but I don't know if you live as long. I would like to see the mortality, the, the life expectancy of people who are extremely tall. I just, Does it have to do with the activation of growth pathways? Growth pathways or just fueling a, a bigger body. You know, the, the, the work, a the greater metabolic do, the organs. kind of demand. Yeah, I don't know. And then I think sometimes I think our pursuit of a bigger frame and holding more muscle is it taking years of our Well, life? that was Dr. Furman's position in my episode with him. Really? Yeah, he he doesn't want to be bigger than his kind of body's natural set point. I think that's point. too sometimes. Like sometimes I'm thinking the pursuit of just that extra gram of muscle and being a little bit bigger, a little bit more jacked is like, what is this doing to my long-term health? Do I need that muscle to live a long, healthy life? Does that also life? make you think about oh, your rep range? Because you yeah, want to be strong, be strong right? for longevity, yes. but you can be strong without packing on a lot 100%. of muscle. And the volumes we're doing per week. I reckon I could... <laughs> maintain the same strength I have now doing a third of the volume and probably a third of the reps mm. for sure. And I could have a really strong, healthy body into my you know elderly years without having to take the risks of, and I don't know if these are proven, but there are some theories about muscle protein synthesis, spiking IGF multiple times a day with protein intake, with, with training in the gym every single day, like all these kinds of things, you know, maybe. How much of our sort of fitness paradigm is built upon how resistance training affects longevity versus how it affects aesthetics. <laughs> I can tell you my 20s and 30s, <laughs> the longevity piece was non-existent, just nothing, didn't care. But now the more I think about it, I, I, I'm thinking, do I slightly change my training? And then my ego takes over and I'm like, no, I just keep the muscle. <laughs> Keep doing, keep doing the hypertrophy training. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm talking. I experience the same internal dialogue. Yeah, but I'm actually slowly coming to terms with not training to just with the sole purpose of increasing muscle size. Sure, but then the other argument is, if these blue zoners did do some resistance training, even twice a week, full body resistance training twice a week in a gym setting, would they add two, three extra years? Well, to here's their life? a study for you to go and do. You can okay. do a field study, okay. maybe with Dan. All right. Dan, let's get a dynamometer <laughs> and let's go and measure the grip strength of yeah. blue zones. Yeah. Because it might be that they're actually incredibly strong for their are. height. No, 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 they're strong. And remember what th that study we were looking at, yeah. grip strength to height ratio is what's really important. True. That's true. I thought you were going to say 
put hundreds to put centenarians on a uh, <laughs> resistance training program and see how many extra years they get out of their life. But I mean, look, I think that they are strong. Uh, they're physically active. I mean, you can't ride a horse and chop wood if you're not strong, right? But again, that grip strength is a proxy for f- total body strength. They are strong. You can tell everything they do is on their feet. They walk up hills, stairs. They're putting their body through stress. But just- they get that strength through everyday life, the way that they just navigate their environment, True. not through going into the gym. That's not, not saying structured. that gym is, is not effective. It's just saying that, yeah, they're, they're, they're not being intentional. Correct. And I think that because our environment is different to theirs, we have to, we be, have intentional. to be intentional. We have to essentially trick our muscles into thinking it's chopping wood by going to the gym and lifting that weight. Whilst for them, it's just it's built in. Everything they do... They're holding heavy things. They're carrying. That you know, even a farmer's carry. Think about that exercise in the gym. What do you think that's doing? It's mimicking what a farmer does in their everyday labor, physical labor. They have more inconvenience in their life, more resistance. More resistance. We you know we want to take the the path of least resistance, right. and we've built a convenient exactly. life in all of these cities. Exactly. And with that, we've. We, we essentially have removed actual physical resistance that we have to move our body against. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so true. What an irony is that we, our life is set up for ease and comfort and we have to seek out the resistance and the difficulty like intentionally, like put it, sit in an ice bath for four minutes, um, go to the gym and lift something heavy. Whilst if you think about the way they live, they're exposed to the elements probably a bit more. They don't have this sort of central heating and you know, heaters and whatever that we have in our environment, in our everyday homes. Um, and for them just to survive, they are f- like so much more physically active. Like the, the resistance is all around them. Even in getting from A to B, they have to do it by foot in most places. You know, we, we don't. We have somebody else come on a scooter. And, and because of that, though, and being in that environment for their entire life, I'm speculating here, but I think they're probably a little bit more mentally resilient. Oh, to that kind, that kind of challenge, that kind of resistance, right? And so they're they're probably better at kind of enduring some of that discomfort, sure. And then they reap the rewards. So they have a discomfort kind of built into their daily life through their entire life, and the the reward for that is more comfort at the end of life yes. and for longer. Yes, yeah, but you don't see it in the moment, right? And again, like. I think their baseline level of discomfort compared to ours, like the idea of not having this table and this chair, and we had to do this podcast on the floor for two and a half hours. How would your body hold up? My back Maybe. and hips would be in right. pieces. And as a result of that, we don't do it because it hurts, right? The resistance <laughs> is so much. We're like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's sit on the chair. I did yoga this morning. <laughs> and, and at the end, I'm I'm pretty <laughs> decent at a lot of poses, but one of the poses that I'm just terrible at it's just sitting cross-legged Same. <laughs> and if you if you ask me to sit cross-legged Same. and then lean forward my knees are up my forget ears. it yeah. forget it yeah, yeah. like it's it's not happening yeah it's just a, like a hip mobility uh, yeah yeah uh, barrier i mean there was one of the guys in the in the doco was sitting cross-legged during the interview on the ground and then he just push, pushes like plants his hands on the ground and lifts his body off and he's this guy's like 100 and he's now like weight bearing his whole body weight with crossed legs you know, like a freaking seesawing his body back and forth. I can't do that. I don't have the mobility for it because our environment's so comfortable and it hurts so much that I avoid it. Whilst for them, it's just a way of living and their body adapts and that's, that's their new baseline. It really makes me want to go live in Sardinia or somewhere. I know I can't just move tomorrow. But... And get rid of this table and these chairs. And social media. Well, that's an idea for another podcast. Else. Well, Should we do a seated one one day? Let's... I think it'd be pretty impressive <laughs> if we episode. could build up to doing two, three-hour podcast sitting cross-legged. And just moving around on the ground in different positions and mm. challenge accepted. I could do it if I was in a deep squat. Let's do it. What, two and a half hours in a deep squat? I can- Come on now. <laughs> I can hold hey. a deep squat for at least 30, 30 seconds. 30, 30 minutes. You're off your head. Prove I promise it. you. This guy, come on I now. promise you. You reckon you can sit passively most, at the bottom? Most mornings, I will deep squat and like right at the, at the table or- check my email on my phone in a deep squat for a very long sustained period. Minutes. Sustained period. You've seen my dorsiflexion. You, you, you've got a good deep squat with <laughs> feet parallel and narrow, I, which is you're set for it. 
I don't know about 30 minutes. That is a long time. Over the day, you can okay, accumulate we'll 30 minutes. We'll time it. Okay, fine. Let's do a podcast on the ground one day, though. Okay. It'd be great. Be Challenge fun. accepted. All right. What else you got in the uh, scholarly library there? <laughs> My bag of studies here. You've got so many studies. I love it. I don't even know what they're going to be. Let's hear it. Well, it. the other resource that I wanted to put into the show notes was a new resource on the portfolio diet. So not to, to confuse people too much, but th- we'll have the link for the Danish dietary guidelines in there. And then also this this new PDF on the portfolio diet, which is an evidence-based eating plan for lowering cholesterol. So this might be more specific to the person who has gone and done a blood test, spoken with their doctor, and they've said, your cholesterol's high. Before we consider medication, I'd like you to make some lifestyle changes. And some folks that have been listening for a while might remember episodes with Dr. David Jenkins. Mm-hmm. He actually came up with the portfolio diet in Canada. And Andrea Glenn, she's one of the, the researchers that has worked alongside David Jenkins, um, looking at the portfolio diet and how it affects biomarkers. And more recently, and this is one of the studies I want to talk about, how it affects cardiovascular disease events. Um, but quickly, this PDF is updated. So I had shared this a while back and it it really just very simply outlines what the portfolio diet looks like. There's five key components. There's nuts and seeds, 45 grams a day. Um, plant protein, having 50 grams of plant protein a day. That's actual protein uh, from plants. Uh, fiber. 20 grams a day from from viscous or sticky fiber sources, and it explains what that means. Mm-hmm. Plant sterols and oils that are rich in monounsaturated fats. Mm-hmm. And all of this is based off clinical studies, and they show that when you add together these five different pieces of advice, for each one you can get about a 5 to 10% uh, expected lowering of LDL cholesterol. Which, if you were to add that up, that could be you know in the ballpark of twenty-five to fifty percent reduction. Mm. So you know a fairly significant reduction, which would be on par with some medications like certain statins mm-hmm. that that exist. Uh, and what I like about this is that it's focusing on what you add. It's not telling you to eat a particular dietary label. It's not saying eat vegan or eat vegetarian or whatever. It's it's focusing on ticking these things off, and by virtue of that, you eat less of of other foods the in the diet. Right. Um, but that's how the clinical studies have looked at this diet. They've they've got people to add these things, and 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 through the focus on addition, you see these reductions in right. LDL cholesterol. Um, so that's a good resource. Now, so just just quickly on that protein. So you said fifty grams of plant protein. Okay, is that as a swap? So swap 50 grams of animal for this and you're going to get a reduction in approximately 5%? Or is this like a total ballpark that you're trying to hit? You're trying to hit 50 grams from plant protein and they do talk about replacing like cow's milk with a soy milk, for okay. example, okay. or replacing ground beef with um, ground soy or lentils right. or replace meat with tofu strips in a stir fry. But it's not saying... Only eat 50 grams of protein per day. No. You can eat more than that. It's just saying try to hit 50 grams of right. plant protein. These are minimum Minimums. prescriptions. Gotcha. So it's saying try and get 50 grams. It's, it's, it's basically saying to the average person who's getting you know, very minimal plant protein in their diet. Right. We want you to dial that up. Yes. And part of that recommendation, part of the reason for that is if you consume 50 grams of plant protein per day, your saturated fat's gone down, your fiber's gone up, your polyunsaturated fats have gone up. That's what I like about that message of focus more on plant protein. You're ticking off three other things, you know, inevitably, which is like more fiber. Because when you're eating those legumes, like as you say, they're not packaged with saturated fat. They do come with fiber and carbohydrate. Which surprises me, you know, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who I've, I've, I put a video out a while back. Yeah. Um, we don't need to go into the details yeah. on that, but I, I I do appreciate a lot of her message. Yeah, she just brought out a book on longevity, and she talks a lot about the importance of muscle mass yeah. and protein intake. And I would agree with her that 
protecting skeletal muscle and preserving sure. strength as you age is really important. Mm. Reducing your risk of sarcopenia, improving your metabolic health by having healthier skeletal muscle. Where we would disagree is I think you can do that with an emphasis on plant protein and then derive the cardiometabolic benefits from those substitutions. Yep. So you can protect the musculoskeletal system, the muscle, and also the bone health mm. by having enough protein or optimal protein. But at the same time, shift blood lipids, shift blood pressure, yeah. shift these other really important risk factors in the right direction. Yeah. So you kind of hedge your bets against uh, having a fall and a fracture, sure. but also having a heart attack stroke or developing type 2 diabetes. Oh, man, you're preaching to the converted here. It's, it, to me, it's an absolute no-brainer, and I can't believe that this message isn't more widespread. I, I, can't, I can't believe it. I, I'm, even when I try to hear the other side of the argument as to why you should eat more red meat and more protein, I, I just can't buy into it. Well, that argument is based on the premise that the quality of the protein in red meat is better. Superior. And that the bioavailability is better. But I would agree that that is... There is some truth to that, and it could be clinically relevant in the context of a low to perhaps moderate protein intake. Mm. But if you are consuming what I'd say is optimal, mm. get above 1.3 grams per kilogram, Yes, hopefully towards 1.5, 1.6 grams, then I, I think you remove any of the... Um, clinical meaning or the clinical differences between the bioavailability of protein from animal yes. to plant because the outcomes that we see right. with regards to muscle strength and lean mass, they disappear. Right. So you've got to hit that high enough absolute amount of protein intake. And once you hit that threshold, if it's coming mostly from plants, you're setting yourself up for right. success in so many other areas other than just the muscle size and strength. So I think that that's the best protocol yeah. is optimize Same. protein intake to hit what we know will support muscle protein synthesis, right. reduce uh, muscle loss as you age, maintain your strength as you age, yes. maintain your bone strength as you age, but have a bias to plant protein. Yes. So at the same time, you're reducing your risk of cardiometabolic right. disease. And Let's go back to a real, you know, real life example, which we've just spoken about. I know a lot, but these blue zone populations are eating most of their protein from plants. They are very physically capable, right? They don't have this protein muscle deficiency. They're living long lives, so it's like I, I just look at a population that's walking the walk, and I think, why, why wouldn't we just try to at, at least try to focus on the dietary part of what they're doing? And then, of course, there's so many other aspects to it outside of diet, but. We also know that they're not eating a lot of red meat. And they, if you can get it from plant protein, what the, the other side of the argument will say is, yeah, but when you eat a lot of plant protein, you have to eat a high carb diet. You're getting a lot of lectins, all of these things. Again, living examples will beg to differ that these things matter. Like the blue zones eat a very, very high portion of their, their diet is carbohydrates. They have less diabetes than most of the population, which comes back to that study you were saying by, was it Roy Taylor? Who was mentioning about this, the fat being a very important piece of the puzzle, even though we have CGMs and we measure glucose yes. when it comes to diabetes, right. saturated fat and where you store your fat is a very important part of the picture that's just not spoken about enough. When we look at the blue zones, they eat a lot of carbohydrates but they have very low rates of type 2 diabetes, especially compared to more Western mm. populations. Yeah, and you can point to phytates and lectins sure. and, and, and all of these things. But as you say, that's that doesn't seem to be playing out when you look at outcomes right. that matter. Yeah. So like, despite that, okay, sure, these dietary patterns contain more phytates and more lectins, but people have less risk of developing cancer. Yeah. They're not having as many heart attacks. They're not having as many strokes. They're living longer. So that's pretty compelling to me. And I I know in many ways why that message isn't more widespread. And it it's goes back to the idea of if you can tell somebody that the food that they love eating right now is the best thing for them, despite the evidence saying the opposite, people want to hear that. So we're going to tell people what they need to hear. Some people will tell people what they want to hear. But There's that quote, people love to hear good things about their bad habits. Bang. Yeah. I mean, the day that this, you know, the keto proponents came out and said, Butter, bacon, and eggs. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> Go for it, guys. As long as you're metabolically healthy, you can eat as much as you want. When people heard that, I mean, they were celebrating. And that's when their plates changed. And I, I mean, I know that when I ate that sort of diet, my LDL cholesterol was not pretty. <laughs> it wasn't good. And I justified it because I'm a thin body weight and I've got a six pack. But come on. Right. And then you could jump online and you can always find someone that will help you justify that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then your algorithm will feed you that information. And then it's just an echo chamber and you believe it and you never change until you have a health scare that makes you change, which is sort of what I, what I did. Okay. So the reason I brought up the portfolio diet yeah, sorry. was that Andrea Glenn just published a new paper with David Jenkins and also Walter Willett, mm -hmm. all-star lineup on this yeah, paper, wow. Frank Hu as well. Uh, among others. And so this was a uh, study that looked at three prospective cohort studies. So the nurses health study one, the nurses health study number two, and then the health professionals follow-up study. Mm -hmm. These are three different long-term prospective cohort studies following big populations of people over decades, up to 30 years. And there's been multiple studies into these cohorts. So many studies, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And in fact, this, these are the three studies that I basically dedicated the entire episode with Walter Willett to talking about. Mm -hmm. And one of the advantages of these three prospective cohort studies is, I mean, they're all based in the US. Um, they are you know, nurses or health professionals. Mm -hmm. So they're people that are health focused, you know, generally across the board, people that are, they're working in the health industry. So you'd expect them to be a little, a little more... Uh, healthy in terms of the lifestyle that they're leading. Yeah, they've got like more of a holistic approach. Right. And then within that, you can look at with this group of kind of uh, healthy people, you can look at differences in red meat intake, for example, right. and outcomes. Right. And two of these, the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2, these were cohorts of women. And then the, the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study was like 43,000 men. Okay. And... Unlike a lot of long-term studies that go for 20 or 30 years, they actually assess the diet every four years, which is much better from an analysis point of view because you can see how diets change. Right. You, instead of just taking a snapshot of this. Yeah. And assume long, you assume from day one, day one that they've had the same diet linear, for 30 years. No, it can fluctuate. So you, you can see these fluctuations would be better, right? And you yeah. Them. And so what they did was they developed a portfolio diet score and- what that looked like was they positively ranked foods like plant protein, mm -hmm. nuts and seeds, viscous fiber sources, phytosterols, and plant monounsaturated fat sources. So pretty much those five things in the portfolio diet PDF that I reeled off before, they got you got a positive point if you were consuming those. Right. And then you negatively it negatively ranked foods that were high in saturated fat and cholesterol. Okay. So what you end up with is these kind of uh, quintiles, you know, of people that sort of adhere lowest to a portfolio diet, and then those that adhere highest. Mm -hmm. And you can compare these different um, categories of adherence to the portfolio diet for specific outcomes. And so the outcomes that they were looking at were a, a bunch of cardiovascular disease. Um, outcomes like coronary heart disease, stroke, and then total cardiovascular disease. Unsurprisingly, they they found that people who were scored high on the portfolio diet score, they had about a fourteen percent lower risk in all um, in ca total cardiovascular disease events. Now, what was really interesting was that. Even those in quintile five, so the highest scores, mm -hmm. they were not consuming the portfolio diet as it's been used in randomized controlled trials. Right. So, so even that, if you do it moderately well, yes, you still get a fourteen percent so, risk reduction. So the people that were kind of best adhering to the portfolio diet right. were not completely adhering to it. And is it fair to say that they are their baseline risk was already fairly low because they are a, a potentially a healthier group of people, a bit more health conscious, they're nervous, yeah, probably they're lower educated, than, general, than general population, right? And so the researchers concluded that to achieve intake in the highest quintile, one could approximately one could add approximately one half cup of beans or one cup of soy milk, 
one cup of cooked oatmeal, one half cup of eggplant, half an ounce of nuts, and one tablespoon of olive oil to one's diet per day to substitute for foods higher in saturated fat and cholesterol, such as red and processed meat, butter, eggs with yolk, and high fat dairy. Wow. It's very achievable. Super achievable. Very achievable. So it's not just what you're adding in, it's what you're swapping it for. You get this coupling effect. Right. right. And so, so just that kind of modest degree of, of changes, that, that resulted in a 14% lower risk of right. cardiovascular disease. Mm. And then something for people to keep an eye on is I believe Andrea, Glenn, and, and Dr. David Jenkins are hoping to now do a long-term randomized controlled trial. Yeah. Awesome. So with people, probably secondary prevention, people that have had cardiovascular events before, mm. I would imagine, randomize them, put some onto the portfolio diet. Hopefully they're working with a dietitian and have high adherence. And then over time, look at cardiovascular events, mm. which would be stronger data than this because this is observational. Uh, but this as an observational study is quite a good one in terms of the fact that the uh, food frequency questionnaire was conducted every four years. Yep. They had a fairly robust multivariate analysis, which basically means that they considered differences in smoking and alcohol and hormone use and menopause status and BMI and all of these things in their statistics mm. to try and see more of a the independent effect of the differences in diet right. on cardiovascular disease. Right. Because a lot of people will point to the healthy user bias, right? When you look at yeah. observational evidence. Yeah, which is essentially saying, well, maybe the people that ate more nuts and seeds and plant protein and plant sterols and monounsaturated fats and viscous fiber and therefore had a higher portfolio diet score, maybe they also exercised more. Right. Maybe they drank less alcohol. Yeah. Maybe they were uh, more educated. Maybe they're, uh, they're, they were taking a multivitamin. All of that stuff is considered in the yep. model. So you collect that data, yep. put it into the model. So you try and essentially through statistics, make it more of an even playing field right. such that the effect that you're seeing is hopefully um, an, an effect that is driven by the differences in the diet, mm -hmm. not the differences in the other aspects of their lifestyle. It's sure. not going to be perfect, sure, but it's it's... It's something that the researchers are aware of. I think a lot of people just assume that yeah. that's not considered. Right. It goes into the model. Believe it or not, these researchers who dedicate their entire life to this thing, they thought about that thing that you thought about too. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and also, I think, just to sort of double click on the other thing that I just said before, is that not only do they control for these confounding factors, but the cohort themselves, you would imagine like across the board, are a similar sort of subject, right? In terms of... We know their occupation is probably similar. Their degree of health consciousness, their holistic approach to well-being is already very similar. So then when you make these intervention changes or these dietary changes, all of those other factors are already kind of similar across the board and they control for them if there are any differences. The other thing is they had blood biomarker data from these subjects. Okay. And the, the folks who w had scored higher on the portfolio diet score also tended to have healthier blood lipids, which... We kind of already know that happens because there's lots of randomized controlled trials on the portfolio diet um, and you see reductions in LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And then they also had lower levels of certain inflammatory markers like interleukin-6 and high sens sensitivity uh, C-reactive protein. Mm. Um, so this is not surprising that there's a reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease because we know that these foods, nuts right. and seeds, plant protein, viscous fiber, plant sterols, and monounsaturated fats or oils rich in monounsaturated fats like uh, olive oil, for example, we know that these types of dietary patterns improve blood pressure. Yes. They imp improve blood lipids, right. improve inflammatory markers, all of which are risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Now, if you're not in the highest quintile and you step your way down, do you get an incremental stepwise sort of uh, improvements in outcomes and health benefits? Even if you don't hit that perfect score, as you step towards a better score, do you see like a linear improvement? Yeah, so it was there was a, a linear dose-dependent uh, relationship. Right. Um, so you saw exactly that. You know, the, the higher 
the portfolio diet score, the, the greater the risk, but you were getting benefits along the way. Right. And in fact, the conclusion from the researchers, because they have a section which is what are the clinical implications of this? And one of the points they say is that this study highlights that even partial adoption of the portfolio dietary pattern can confer cardiovascular benefits. Mm. Um, this yeah. is probably one of the number one resources that I send to people. If someone hits me up on an email or an inbox and says, hey, you know, I've gone to my, my doctor and I've had my, lo- my labs done. I have a family history of cardiovascular disease. I have high blood pressure. I have a high elevated cholesterol. My doctor's told me to make some lifestyle changes you know, with a focus on nutrition. Like, what do I do? Read these two pages yeah. <laughs> as a starting point. Yeah. And now, would you say that a, was it the Danish guidelines, mm-hmm. Canadian food plate, are they similar to a portfolio style Mediterranean diet? Like, are there, is, this, is, there, is there a common theme between Yeah. All well, of if, these? so if you adopt the, the Canadian dietary guidelines, which again has a specific sentence that says, choose healthy sources of protein, preferably plants. I think it's. I think. I think that's the wording. Seems, let, me, let me look that like up. That. Yeah. Let me look that up. I yeah, wanna, I remember because I, I remember reading there the the so Canada Food Plate, I believe it is, and thinking they are very plant predominant in terms. And it, there's the focus on plant proteins. It's something like that. I'm sure you'll p- pull it up now, but they definitely had a focus on plant proteins. And I believe that. I don't even think dairy was on the was dairy on the plate. If something wasn't on the plate that I was kind of they shocked removed about. dairy for the first time, right? And they also spoke about the fact that this was the first time they were not allowing input from industry. Yeah, yeah. Let me get the wording for you here. Mm-hmm. Okay, it says vegetables, fruit, whole grains, and protein foods should be consumed regularly. Among protein foods, consume plant-based more often. Yeah, there we go. That's the wording. Yeah. Which is in line with this. Yeah. So to your point, if you eat according to the Danish dietary guidelines or Health Canada- You're going to score pretty well in a portfolio diet. Yes. Yeah. You're you're automatically scoring really, really highly in terms of the portfolio diet score. Now, one thing that the portfolio diet does have an emphasis on that is- uh, not included in the Danish Dietary Guidelines or Health Canada is this focus on plant sterols. Mm -hmm. And they say these occur naturally in plant foods, nuts, soybeans, peas, canola oil. But to get this amount will require a supplement or fortified foods like spreads, juices, or yogurts. So they recommend two grams Mm -hmm. a day of plant sterols. Now, uh, remember, this is for people that are high risk of cardiovascular disease or have cardiovascular disease. I think if you're low risk of cardiovascular disease, then just sticking to the Danish Dietary Guidelines or Health Canada is as far as you need to go. But if you're someone that's high risk and has been told you really need to make lifestyle changes, the reason plant sterols are in there is that they can help further lower LDL cholesterol and ApoB. Now, we're going right into the weeds, but it's nice to connect some dots here. Yeah. There is one kind of context where having plant sterols is probably not a great idea because plant sterols can be atherogenic okay if too many of them get into the blood okay and this will come down to the receptors in the um, small intestine where cholesterol is absorbed okay so Neiman pick C1 like one receptor say that one more time Neiman <laughs> Name and pick. Five Neiman, times fast. Name and pick. See one like one. Name and pick. See one like one. Name so. and pick. See one like one. <laughs> Name and pick. See one like one. Name and this pick, is going to be see one like one. You said five times. That sound That's bite is going to be grabbed. I don't know where it's going to end up, but I hope the internet does something really good with that. <laughs> okay, so Name and pick. See one. Like one. <laughs> now, if. If you got through the seven hours with Thomas Dayspring, you might recall he spoke about that receptor. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's actually, that receptor is where both cholesterol and plant sterols are absorbed in the gut. I'm just, I can only hear in my head is, I'm seeing, yeah, that's all I'm hearing. See see one like one. (laughs) Oh no, we've done it again. Someone needs to rename that. Oh no, okay. No. Uh, Yeah, so Dayspring... 
spoke about anyway, that. long story short, yeah. you can, before you were g- going to take a high dose uh, plant sterile supplement, two yeah. grams a day, you can actually go and do a, a test right. with a laboratory. Uh, I think one of them in the States is Boston Heart. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Empower DX might do it. I'll put the link into the show notes. It's actually in the lipid series cheat sheet that I made, so I'll put a link to that. Yeah. But you can do a test, long story short, that looks at the amount of phytosterols in your blood. Right. Uh, campesterol and cytosterol. They're two types of these plant sterols. Right. If, if they're really high, really high, don't supplement. Don't supplement okay. with that. Yeah. If they're not really high, then you could supplement and then retest and see. So this isn't one of those things where it's like, do no harm, just supplement anyway. No. Check, make sure. Exactly. So I think there's this idea out there, and I think a few doctors have have uh, done videos about how dangerous plant sterols are. Right. And then it scared everyone, but it's context dependent. Okay. So depending on your baseline, right, and your baseline is going to be dependent on that receptor, whatever pathway you were just talking about. Right. So in the portfolio diet, the reason the sterols is encouraged to supplement or take more of is because. If you're already high risk of cardiovascular disease, it can improve your... Well, this is where I think it's really interesting, and I'd love to speak to David Jenkins about this, is what's probably happening here is the plant sterols, because they're taken up by the same receptor, the, the way that they lower cholesterol is by sort of blocking the cholesterol that can be absorbed okay. in the gut. Gotcha. Right? Because they kind of go through that receptor and, and in that process of blocking cholesterol, which is come into the gut either through diet or bile. Okay. And then because they're blocking it, more of that cholesterol gets excreted. Then the liver says, hey, I need to produce more bile. And it sucks in ApoB-containing lipoproteins gotcha. and then it comes down. But the, the, I guess the, the really interesting question here is there's no long-term outcome data or supplement trials that I've seen where people take plant sterols and you show a reduction in risk of cardiovascular events. Yes. So... Thomas Dayspring might say, hey, yeah, you're lowering ApoB, but you're increasing these plant sterols, which are atherogenic. So are you actually increasing risk here? So I I don't know the answer to Mm. that, and I don't think there's a study that can help us answer that. Mm. So if I was to say, what's like the um, most debatable aspect of this portfolio diet? Mm. It's the inclusion of plant sterols. Why can't you eat that amount in in Food rich. Sources. I just don't think that the the foods, even though they contain plant sterols, contain enough dose. such that you would you would have to consume too many calories. Right. But the dose that they're saying there, I'm assuming the body of evidence shows that if you can hit that dose through supplementation, you're gonna improve your cardiovascular outcomes. Well, no, I would disagree with that. Really? I think the evidence shows that you'll get a five to ten percent reduction in your cholesterol. By getting to two grams, okay, and, the and there are supplement say- trials. But if at the same time you're doing that at the expense of jacking up plant sterols in circulation okay. that are atherogenic, then what's the net effect on having a stroke or having a heart attack? And I don't think that that data exists. So there is a there's a, a leap. It is semi logical that while plant sterols lower cholesterol, they must improve cardiovascular disease events. I don't know that. You can make that um, in spite of the fact that plant sterols themselves in mm. circulation can be atherogenic. Wow. Okay. So then when it comes to trying to get a high score, would you not just be better off aiming for the other? So eat more plant protein, um, eat more monounsaturated fats or unsaturated fats. So the other tiers of this protocol. Personally, Four if I was doing this, this is how I would approach it. Yeah. I would... Certainly get my dietary pattern in order first. I would yeah. concentrate on all the food aspects. I would go and measure my plant sterile levels. Yeah. And if my ApoB was not at goal with all of the dietary changes and I wanted to get it lower, and let's say I didn't want to take a ZMIB or statins or PCSK9 inhibitor for whatever reason. Yeah. Not that I think those drugs don't have their place. They do, but a lot of people will want to try lifestyle first. Then I would introduce the plant sterols, but then I would retest. Right. Okay. Test retest. Cytosterol and campesterol. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're taking the plant sterol supplements and you're seeing that the plant sterols in circulation are going to crazy high levels, yeah. 
just be aware that they could also be atherogenic. So basically, if you choose to follow a blue zone style diet, a Mediterranean diet, Canada's food plate or the Danish guidelines, no matter which iteration of that diet you choose to follow, you're going to score pretty well in the portfolio diet. And of those five areas of focus that the portfolio diet are highlighting, those other diets are going to tick off pretty much four of them, maybe not the sterol, the plant sterols as much. Is that fair to say? And I would say the the st- strongest components of the portfolio diet from an evidence-based point of view, if we're considering not just reduction in LDL cholesterol, but reduction in events, is the other four components. So nuts and seeds, plant protein, fiber, and olive oil, monounsaturated fat rich oils, we actually have outcome data to suggest that increasing exposure to those will reduce events. We don't necessarily have that data that I've seen for plant sterols. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, you're right. If you adopt a diet according to the Danish Dietary Guidelines or Health Canada, which we'll put into the show notes, Mm -hmm. then by default, these things, except for plant sterols, supplements, uh, take care of themselves. Right. And uh, again, just double clicking on the sterols, you're still getting plant sterols in your diet, right? You're just not supplementing with them. Right. What we're talking about here is does the addition of a plant sterile supplement. Right. Or fortified food. Or fortified food, so that could be from like a butter or a spread, right? Or a juice or yogurt. There are some brands out there. The question is, does the plant sterile at two grams a day, which is over and above what you just get from eating nuts and seeds, does that actually lower your risk of cardiovascular events, or could it increase risk? Mm-hmm. Could it be that the plant sterols? By competing with cholesterol absorption, yes, they lower cholesterol, but you end up with a high concentration of plant sterols in the blood that that are atherogenic. And what I'm saying is, I don't really know what the net effect of plant sterols is. Right. So you can get 80% of the way there following on those other four areas of focus. If you want to potentially explore that other 20%, do the genetic test. Yes, do the t- the plant Sorry, sterile, test phytosterol test, because if you're someone that can take two grams a day of plant sterols and it lowers your LDL cholesterol, but you don't have this big spike of plant sterols in circulation, then that is a is is probably a less risky play than the next person who, yes, they get an LDL cholesterol lowering effect, but they have this super high plant sterile concentration. Gotcha. If that was me, I would err on the side of caution and probably not consume plant sterols in a supplement or in a fortified food. Cool. Makes perfect sense to me. Hey, friends. If you'd like to stay connected and reinforce the valuable insights from this show, let's connect on Instagram. You can find me at Simon Hill. That's at Simon Hill. I look forward to seeing you there. All right. Let's dive back into the episode. Okay, last yeah. study. <laughs> Let's get it. If people are still oh, here. Someone's listening. This happens every episode. There's always someone okay, listening. Okay, I think we've been going for a little over two hours, so perhaps we'll try and crush this one in 10 minutes. Right. This is a, uh, a study that was published, uh, again, from Walter Willett and colleagues, and it was looking at red meat intake and risk of type 2 diabetes. Another study that looked at those three cohorts, U.S. cohorts, Mm -hmm. Nurses Health Study 1, 2, and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. And uh, interestingly, rather than just grouping all red meat together, which a lot of studies do, they separated the type of red meat. So they looked at the association between total red meat intake and type 2 diabetes risk, processed red meat, intake and type 2 diabetes risk and unprocessed red meat intake and type 2 diabetes risk. Mm. So they looked at all three of those um, in separate analyses. Remember that in each of these three prospective cohorts, which when combined, there's over 200,000 subjects and they're followed for up to 30 years. In each of these, they collected dietary data every four years. Mm. Okay, much more reliable than doing it as a once-off. But even 
More importantly, and very interestingly, this study used a, a new type of analysis where they were able to calibrate the food frequency questionnaire data using a seven-day weighed food record. Mm -hmm. So they had a subset of subjects from these cohorts who, for a week on two occasions, did weighed food records. Right. They were taught how to weigh their food. They weighed everything that they consumed, right. which removes the memory, the recall aspect. We know people suck at memory recall when it comes to what they ate. Right. So the idea here is if we have this subset of people where we have weighed food records yeah. and we also have their food frequency questionnaires, we can see how what foods do people kind of overestimate right. their consumption of and underestimate and which ones do they get right. And then we can use that to calibrate the overall body of food frequency questionnaire data that we have for the whole cohort. Got it. And in this case, for the three cohorts. So you get a more accurate representation of what people are actually eating. Yep. Okay, so it's kind of like a more robust prospective observational nutrition study yep. than what we would have seen in previous years. And I, I suspect this will be a statistical analysis that a lot of studies start to use now yep. if they have the seven-day weighed food records. Why do you think that other studies haven't done this? Why is this calibration with weighed food cross-checked against these questionnaires something that isn't way more um, broadly used? Not all studies have the seven-day weighed food records. Right. Often that is just done to validate the questionnaire uh -huh. initially, yeah. but it's not done over time and not and may not be done with that specific cohort. Mm. That's one thing. And then you know, just, just, just as, the field, of... as the field advances, yeah. we get more specific and people ask questions. How can we, how can we make this data more reliable? Yeah. And someone's come up with this technique. Mm -hmm. um, so what did they find? Well, total red meat, processed red meat and unprocessed red meat were all strongly associated with type 2 diabetes risk and it was a linear relationship right. dose dependent right so the more of each of those the higher the risk of type 2 diabetes i mean and just going back to our earlier conversation for for many people this sounds so counterintuitive that that meat something that doesn't contain glucose could worsen your risk for a condition that is completely related to glucose it just pe it fi people find it very hard to get their head around this, but I I'm sure we'll dig into it a little bit of the sort of mechanisms as to why this occurs. Well, your ability to regulate glucose levels or glucose homeostasis is also affected by other dietary constituents, mm -hmm. particularly the makeup of fat. So one of the proposed mechanisms that they speak about is the, the fact that when you're consuming more red meat, you have a higher consumption of saturated fat. Yep relative to the person who's consuming less red meat and instead eating you know, nuts and legumes, yep. which was one of the substitutions they looked at that offered most uh, benefit with regards to type 2 diabetes risk reduction in this mm -hmm. um, study. They had a substitution analysis part. Um, so saturated fat was one of the proposed mechanisms. Um, saturated fat in clinical studies... Uh, where they've been able to compare saturated fat to polyunsaturated fats, you, you see increase in insulin resistance yep. when cal more calories come from saturated fat. You see the opposite when you switch people to more calories from polyunsaturated fat. Mm -hmm. There's also preclinical evidence to suggest that saturated fat actually impairs beta cell function. Mm -hmm. um, heme iron, which is rich in red meat, has mm -hmm. been shown to impair beta cell function in the pancreas, which is where insulin is released. So there's a bunch of different mechanisms, and, and those ones apply to all types of red meat. And then processed red meat also contains nitrates, and nitrates have been shown to increase endothelial dysfunction and promote insulin resistance. So there's a, a variety of mechanisms that could help explain these associations. Um, I should add that when the researchers compared the uncalibrated data to the calibrated the associations strengthened. Mm. So um, what I mean by that is, for example, for total red meat consumption, one serving a day 
in the uncalibrated model, mm -hmm. increased risk of type 2 diabetes by 28%. When they calibrated it, increased risk by 47%. And what was a serve classified as? Serving is 85 grams of unprocessed red meat, so yep. pork, beef, or lamb, or uh, 28 grams of bacon or 45 grams of hot dog sausage salami and that that was for the processed red meats small serves eh right and then in the processed red meat analysis uncalibrated model that that one serving again which is 28 grams of bacon or 45 grams of hot dog sausage or salami increased risk by 50% mm -hmm. in the calibrated model increased risk by 100% wow. and then unprocessed red meat which i think many people are most interested in yeah uncalibrated model one serve 85 grams, uh, increased risk by 24%. Yeah. And then when they calibrated the data, that one serving per day increased risk by 51%. Yeah. So then you've got to think about all the studies that have these relative risk associations but are not calibrated with this methodology. Exactly. What would the real risk be? Yeah, so it could be that a lot of the historic studies that haven't calibrated the food frequency questionnaire data might be underestimating... Mm the risk or underestimating the benefit for certain foods. Sure. Wow. Yeah, it just makes you think that does, does this kind of like shake up the body of evidence or does it the trends and patterns still exist? It's just the the um the effect size the effect size could be different. Could be different, right? Yeah, I th I think it's a really compelling finding that when they calibrated the data to the seven day food record, yeah. which is pretty damn accurate. Yeah. It made the association stronger. Mm. So this eliminates the kind of um, the complaint or uh, yeah, the, the, criticism. the pushback, yeah, the, pushback. the criticism mm -hmm. that someone may have on observational studies that says, yes, but dietary recall is poor. Right. Well, when it was calibrated against actually weighing food, it only got stronger. Mm. So wait, so it's, hold on. I, I got to double click on that for a second. So people push back on observational evidence and say, well, if dietary recall is poor, then maybe it's not, it's not so bad. And what this is saying is, yeah, dietary recall is quite poor, but actually the negative effect is even stronger when it's calibrated with a methodology. It's not necessarily saying it's poor. It's saying that we know a weighted food record is going to be more accurate, so we can actually use that to strengthen the, the dietary food frequency questionnaire data that we have, make it even more representative of what people actually ate. Right. And it goes in the direction that they don't want to hear. And then it goes in the, the direction that they don't want to hear. So so their, their criticism is that it's not accurate. Yeah. Okay, well, let's use a tool that makes it more accurate. <laughs> yeah. And then we use that tool to make it more accurate and it only strengthens the association. Okay. All right. I got you, got you. Got you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not something that you want to hear if that's your criticism. Yes. Got gotcha. you. Right. What you would want to hear is the opposite. Hey, we calibrated against the weighed record and the association disappeared. <laughs> yeah. That's not happening. That's not happening. Mm. Or it didn't happen in this study anyway. Yeah. Uh, and I, sh I should add that in the model, the main primary analysis, they adjust for many confounding variables. Yep. I'll reel them off. Mm -hmm. Race, ethnicity, smoking status, alcohol intake, multivitamin use, menopause status and hormone use, family history of type 2 diabetes, antihypertensive drug use, cholesterol-lowering drug use, history of hypertension, glycemic index, poultry, fish, egg, total dairy, nuts and legumes, fruits, vegetables, whole grain, and refined grain intakes, socioeconomic status, and BMI. Mm -hmm. So what that means is they are attempting through a statistical analysis to get a very independent look of how total red meat, processed red meat, and unprocessed red meat affects type 2 diabetes risk. Mm. And they're trying to remove the effect that all of those things I just reeled off right. could be having on risk. Right. So they, they're they adjusting for diet quality. Yes. In essence, by, by including nuts and legumes and yes. fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So if someone has a criticism of, well... When people eat more red meat, they eat less fruits and vegetables. Or so they eat hot dog buns, which is a refined carbohydrate. Yes. Or and, and maybe it's those things that are driving the risk. Well, it's it's just helpful to know that the researchers are aware, again, mm. that um, 
it's likely that people that eat more red meat, yes, they might smoke more or they might eat less fruits and vegetables, but we can use statistical analyses to try and remove yes. the effect that those differences have. Right. And I think a, a really important point to just sort of hammer home here is that you can choose to eat a food that worsens your glycemic control and worsens your risk or increases your risk for type 2 diabetes. You can swap it for a food that actually takes you in the other direction, which means you get this twofold sort of swing or a multifold swing in the other direction. Because we know that swapping saturated fat for unsaturated fat can improve insulin sensitivity independent of weight loss, right? It's, it's the same kind of theme here is that the swap that you make not only can take you from this path towards diabetes away from it, but it can actually improve this, the sensitivity and the biomarkers in the opposite direction. So you get this, this larger swing, a larger magnitude of effect, depending on what the swap is as well. And the other thing, just to kind of really close the loop here, was they did, they did look at how much of this association was driven through body mass index versus other mechanisms that might explain it. Mm -hmm. And yes, the risk of type 2 diabetes was attenuated when you controlled for BMI, but it didn't go away and it was still significant. Yeah. And this kind of comes back and, and speaks to the main takeaways from Roy Taylor's episode. When it comes to diabetes, body fat and personal fat threshold, that that is definitely king. Mm -hmm. But the dietary constituents independent of calories also matter. Yep. Yep. And this study is just further evidence that swapping calories from red meat, as you say, for foods like nuts and legumes, which they specifically did focus on, can significantly reduce your risk of developing type 2 diabetes independent of body weight. Right. And, and for certain people out there, you know, there are ethnic groups who are at risk of type 2 diabetes despite being a healthy BMI. This just sort of double clicks again on that this this food quality still matters. Even if you don't have a lot of weight to lose, you might have type 2 diabetes, you might have metabolic syndrome or a lot of visceral fat, you can still make these swaps and see benefit. Yeah, so if you have much less weight to lose, and I think Roy Taylor would push back and say that even people who are a normal BMI that have excessive visceral fat, they can still lose a bit of weight. Yeah. But... I, w I agree with you that there's going to be less of a focus on weight loss, potentially increasing like a, a greater uh, emphasis on diet quality and then mm -hmm. also exercise. Yeah. As we spoke about before. Right. Yeah. Awesome. I think we did it. I think we did it. What was that? Two plus hours of journal club. I love it. We didn't have any jokes or. I know. You've got a dad joke in there. Come on, let it out. <laughs> Go on. Okay. So, did he see like that? <laughs> <laughs> Should we finish? Or it was no? on the tip of his tongue. Go. I know you. you really what has branches that. but no fruit, trunk or leaves? <laughs> Fitting that we've been speaking about plants. Uh, what is it? What has branches but no fruit, trunk or leaves? You've stumped me. A bank. I was going to say that, <laughs> but I didn't want to make a mistake live in the moment. <laughs> oh, mate. Come on, I'm glad mate. I didn't know that. Have a go. Shows that I'm too Have a young go. for you. <laughs> Have a go. <laughs> I love it. Anything, okay. uh, nothing to get off your chest, hey? You, no, I'm feeling pretty good. Just got back from Bali. Well, there can't be anything to get yeah. off your chest. I'm feeling great. I, I will say it's actually taken me some time to sort of readjust to normal life hey like when you're living in a resort with 50 people around you running on island time yeah it's just different isn't it barefoot shirtless all the time to sort of back in the city and there's a bit of a pace and you're driving a car and there's <laughs> life is Bare, barefoot and shirtless yeah that, that's my everyday life what am i saying <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> not I just <laughs> something that you do in bali that's bondo that's, bondo that's life. i'm pretty sure you do that every day yeah that's true that is true no but you know what i mean it's just the the pace of life and the you're sort of running on this high because you've got this surrounded by this group of new people and it's just different. And then you come home and you've got to sort of readjust and come down from the high a little bit and see the beauties in, in life back home as well. You know, you can't get carried away and think that that's how life should be. It's just not, it's not realistic. Looking forward to planning next year. I cannot wait. Really can't Locations, wait. Locations, yeah. TBC. Yes, stay tuned. But you can put your email in. We have a landing page. Yes. Proof.com forward slash experience. Yep. So, 
visit that web page, put your email in, and we will keep you posted. Yeah. I'm excited for next year. Let us know what you thought of this episode in the comments. <laughs> YouTube comments. What is it, was it interesting? Do you want more of this, less of this? What do you want us to cover? All the things. If you want more dad jokes, let us know. <laughs> Even if you don't, I will <laughs> definitely be bringing more dad jokes. <laughs> good. <laughs> if you have a dad joke, leave it in the comments. Yes. If it's good, we'll repeat it on air. Yeah. Perhaps. It's a great segment. Dad joke of the week. Dad jokes from the community. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Okay. I appreciate you, brother. Mate, Peace. it's good to be back here in Bondi. See you in Bali next year as well. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.